morning as we're tracking CPI, Consumer Price Index, year over year. We're seeing the figure come in at 3.2%. The expectation was for 3.3%. We're taking a look at some of the immediate reaction in the U.S. major averages in the futures here as we're taking a look at some of the specifics within this report. The month over month figure was actually flat here where it was expected to come in at a rise of about one tenth of a percent, Shauna, here. And then X food and energy month over month, that came in at two tenths of a percent year over year, that figure for X food and energy. 4% right now. Yeah, certainly. And digging into this report just a little bit and seeing where some of those pricing pressures still remain. The index for shelter continuing to rise in the month of October, that offsetting some of the decline that we did see in the energy and the gasoline index here. So that's why we did see a resulting, obviously, in the unchanged month over month figure. Energy index falling 2.5% over the month as a 5% decline in the gasoline index. So we're taking a look at how futures are reacting to this print, at least initially. We're seeing some movement here to the upside. But certainly as we dig into this, of course, the question that traders, economists, strategists are all asking is what exactly this means for the Fed and whether or not this changes the calculus at the next meeting. Yeah, you mentioned shelter and the indexes, which increased all in in October. That includes rent, owner's equivalent rent, motor vehicle insurance, medical care, recreational care, or not recreational care, but personal care as well. So <laughs> it's good to see that people are tapping into the deodorants and antiperspirants out there. But the indexes for lodging away from home, used cars and trucks, communication, and airline fares were among those that actually decreased over mm. the month. So some interesting metrics there, especially given all of the airline news that we've been tracking over the course of this week. We'll dive into that later on during our 9 a.m. hour. But let's get to our executive editor, Brian Sazi. He's standing by at the Wi-Fi Interactive at the touchscreen. Hey, Brian. Uh, Brad, of course, deodorant, always very, very important to one's life. Good to see prices for that coming down. So as you mentioned, futures really ticking up on the CPI report. And if you are trading this market, really, there's one thing you need to watch out for. And I think it really explains why you're seeing this market rally. Uh, as you see here, really a strong advance off the CPI report. It is Fed fund futures. Now, coming into this, uh, coming into the CPI print, there was about a 28% chance uh, that the Fed would actually hike rates at its uh, at its gen at its most re recent meeting coming up in December. Now, it's likely that will get dialed back even further, and then by extension. This report, at least initially, looks to give credence to some of the calls we saw out on Monday from Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Maybe we get that first round of rate cuts by mid-June. That's why the market is rallying initially off a print like this. It is feeding that narrative now on Wall Street that disinflation is alive and well. And just anecdotally, you know, I was talking to Tapestry CEO uh, yesterday at a conference here in New York City. I asked her about the inflationary outlook. She is seeing disinflationary forces in her supply chain, and I can tell you, she is not alone. But again, this report initially feeding that disinflation uh, narrative on the street and supporting, uh, I think, a lot of the bullish case uh, that has enveloped stocks over the past month and a half, Shona. All right, Saz, thanks so much. Well, let's dig into this report, exactly what this means here for the economy, what it tells us just about consumer and obviously most importantly for the Fed. And for that, we want to bring in Tendai Katfidze. He's at Wells Fargo Chief Corporate Economist and Nathan Sheets, City Global Chief Economist. Great to have you both here at the table with us. And Tendai, let me start with you just in terms of how you're looking at this report and most importantly, how you think the Fed is looking at these numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a pretty good report, right? Uh, so you get inflation coming in a little bit softer than expected. There had been some concerns that because of seasonality and because of some changes to the way they calculate health care, that you might get a little bit of a pop uh, this month. So it's a good thing that that didn't happen. Uh, as far as the Fed is concerned, though, we have seven Fed speakers today. So there's going to be a lot of Fed speak. I think they will all still be emphasizing that the Fed will raise rates if needed, right? Uh, they kind of have to until inflation is actually down. Mm -hmm. uh, so great numbers, I think, uh, but I think the Fed speakers will still have a bit of a bias towards making sure that everybody understands that rate hikes are still an option, uh, even though that may no longer be the base case. Nathan, I want to bring you in here. The next Fed meeting, December 12th through 13th here, does this change the tenor? Does this change the dialogue in the conversation? You know, I think the markets, I think the Fed was worried that this could be as high as a 0.4. Mm. And to get a 0.2% increase on the core is a very positive development. And I do think on the margin that that allows Jay Powell and his colleagues in December to be a notch less hawkish than they would be otherwise. Now, that said, is the Fed going to be careful? Is the Fed going to avoid saying job done, mission complete, absolutely. 
And I think Jay Powell will continue to try to find ways to preserve this kind of hawkish hold construct. But as time passes, it's getting harder and harder for him to communicate the hawkishness in the whole, especially in the, in the face of ongoing disinflation in the economy. When we talk about what needs to happen in this final mile here, that last mile in the fight to get inflation back to that 2% target, when we talk about potential timeline, exactly how aggressive maybe the Fed will ultimately need to get if they do continue, uh, if they do need to continue to raise rates, what does that look like? And I guess, how do you think the Fed is trying to balance that, what they have been saying now for obviously quite some time here? They're doing everything they can to get inflation under control, but they also are trying to do it without sending the economy into a recession. Yeah, I think if you look at the components of inflation, uh, particularly if you look at housing, uh, which has you know been the hottest part of inflation for the most part of this year, but we know from some of the real-time indicators uh, that the disinflation process in housing and rents is kind of a given, right? So it's going to continue uh, through most of next year. Um, so I think in terms of what's the future path of inflation, uh, you look at housing, I think you're going to be fairly confident uh, that this disinflation process uh, will continue, uh, you know. But as, as Nathan said, right, they're trying to do this hawkish hold, uh, and I think they feel that they have to do it uh, because, in a sense, you kind of fight the last battle until you're confident that you've won it. Uh, but certainly, I think they need to start being a little bit cautious here because as we continue to see uh, disinflation, even without more rate hikes, right, the real rate continues to increase and is going to become more and more restrictive on the economy. So I think they need to start thinking about maybe not publicly communicating when they might start to, uh, you know, ease. Uh, and probably, you know, probably mid next year might be a good time to, to think about doing that. And considering that food, shelter, energy, the, the basic needs for every household. So, you know, as you're continuing to watch that be one of the largest contributors to this inflation print that we've gotten month over month and, and specifically in shelter, how does that continue to impact those other discretionary items that consumers are going into this holiday season trying to determine, all right, am I spending $25 on a person or am I spending $50 on a person or are, are they getting anything at all? At yeah, end? this is a great question, a very important one. As, uh, as some of those necessities uh, start to disinflate uh, more, that does open up uh, a greater scope for just discretionary spending and continues to support the economy. And when we step back and think, what is the underlying driver of this strong economy? And it's the resilient consumer. And what's driving the consumer is the strong labor market, ongoing wage growth, and the fact that consumers have more resources, more money in their pockets to spend. And as inflation comes down, those increases in wages relative to the inflation rate, the real wage, becomes increasingly supportive. So I think this is a, you know, the, the, the move we focus on the core because we think it's a better forecaster of where inflation's gonna go. But the headline and these necessities that are included there are also critical for these kinds of reasons that you point out. Dunda, you mentioned the fact that maybe we could see a cut here in the second half of next year. When we talk about maybe continuous cuts, I guess, what do you see that looking like? Because we certainly have seen predictions that diverge pretty broadly here just in terms of the timing of the cuts and how aggressive maybe the Fed will ultimately get. Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, what, how the unemployment rate and the labor market evolves, right? Uh, so we've had a focus the past few years, obviously on the inflation side of the mandate, mm -hmm. uh, and the labor market has been really strong and really resilient. Uh, the past few months, we've started to see an uptick uh, in the unemployment rate. Now, crucially, that uptick has been because of growth in the size of the labor force, right? It hasn't been because of people getting laid off and losing jobs, right? If we start to see a transition, and we've been seeing the labor market slow down, we've seen the jobs openings rate slow down, we've seen the quits rate uh, kind of increase. Um, if we start to see a weakness in the labor market that is driven by people being unable to find jobs versus uh, the growing size of the labor force, as we've seen the past couple of months, then the Fed needs to start to shift the focus from inflation to the labor market, and that's what's going to determine the pace uh, of any rate cutting cycle. Do you cycle. anticipate that we will see that material weakness in the jobs picture? Uh, we're not seeing it now, right? And I think as long as the consumer remains strong, uh, I think one of the things that's happening is that we've had all these kind of pent up savings um, and all the transfers that people received. 
Now, on a lot of at the lower kind of cohorts of the income, a lot of that money has been spent, but there's a lot of it left at the higher cohorts of income, and there's a lot of it left on business balance sheets and state balance sheets, and that spending passes through the labor market to the rest of the folks who no longer have savings, right? So as long as we continue to see, I think, strong consumer spending from the high end, um, supporting the labor market, uh, then you know we may not see a material deterioration in the labor market. In, in terms of that propensity to spend as yeah. well, in some of those discretionary categories, and I think back to the quote from just this morning from Home Depot as they announced earnings, they said that they have seen pressure in certain big ticket discretionary categories. And for a lot of companies that we've been tracking over the course of this earnings season, it's whether or not student loan payment resumption is impacting the discretionary categories. It's whether or not Ozempic is impacting if I'm eating food away from home that could pass through to a, an inflationary print. Uh, and so all of that considered, is there one prevailing kind of outsized force right now that we're seeing start to play out when it comes to prints like this? Yeah, great, great question. My sense is that coming out of the pandemic, there was a big bulge of consumer spending, especially consumer spending associated with services. Coming out of the pandemic, people hadn't had those services experiences for several years, and they've been paying up for it. And that has supported uh, consumer spending, growth, the economy, but importantly, also inflation over the last 18 months or two years. And that is now transitioning. And I think one of the big questions is, does that services spending become more good spending? And we're seeing some of that. Or does it translate into an overall softer pace of, of consumer outlays? And I think that's what the corporates are worried about. And that question is also tied closely into this issue of what happens next to the labor market. Right. So what do you think this ultimately tells us just about the ability that the Fed could have here to orchestrate a soft landing? How likely is that? Yeah, I think the elusive soft landing might be in play. Um, I think certainly the way the data is evolving, uh, you know, it seems like that's the most likely scenario. Uh, you know, the economy can always uh, surprise you. Uh, but I think, you know, Jay Powell and co got to be pretty happy with these numbers today. All right, we're going to continue to track to see if the markets are happy with these numbers today, at least on the initial outset. It seems that the future is moving in positive territory. Thanks so much for joining us here in studio. Tendaya Kapvidze, who is the Wells Fargo Chief Corporate Economist, and Nathan Sheets, City Global Chief Economist. We'll have more coverage coming up at 9 a.m. on Yahoo Finance Live.
Ali, we're going to talk about that skepticism exactly and more with our panel here. We've got more on how to invest in robotics. So we're going to bring in Ray Wong. He's the principal analyst and founder of Constellation Research. We also have Jason Del Rey here. He's a tech business journalist. He's also the author of Winner Sells All, Amazon, Walmart, and the Battle for Our Wallets. Great to have you both on. And Jason, I want to start with you. As the name of your book suggests, you know these big names very well. So I want to get a sense of the impact robotics investment could have on a name like Amazon in the next five years. How much do you anticipate robotics coming up in Amazon earnings calls? Is it going to get a mention or could it be the headline? I, I think I think it will be mentioned more often, but I think it's it's very important to recognize that, um, you know, in in the last decade, I think we were looking for this Amazon robotics um, advancement to happen even faster than it has. I think the media, maybe maybe even some inside Amazon thought that, um, you know, maybe by now there'd be many fewer workers. And it's just, it's a long, hard problem to solve. Different, They're trying to solve different problems, you know, to, to replicate the human hand in picking and packing of all these items, different shapes and sizes. Um, they're on their way, but I, I would just say, um, you know, they're, they're, they seem to be ahead of the, the pack among e-commerce players, but they still have a long road ahead as well. And Ray, if you had to put a percentage on it, how much do you expect Amazon's margins to improve in its retail business over time due to these robotics? No, it's a great question. And Jason's right. It's going to take some time, but we're talking about the ability to take these margins from 14.5% to high 30s in the future. And that's coming from labor savings. That's coming from the fact that you have less errors. That's also coming from the fact that you got faster, better, and cheaper all in one opportunity. Now, Jason, there are a lot of numbers that we don't know, but there is one that we do, and that's 1.7 billion. That's the amount that Amazon is looking to spend to buy Roomba. Now, what is your sense of the depth of Amazon's ambition in robotics? Is it to make its way all the way into our homes? Yeah, so my opinion on that acquisition is that it, it has just a lot to do with Amazon's uh, intent and play to own as much gadgetry and robotics around the home. So. Everything from Alexa to their uh, Ring acquisition years ago to the Blink uh, security acquisition, um, and now Roomba. So I see it in sort of that same uh, play. You know, in your home, yes, you may be on your phone, but you're interacting with a, all sorts of technology and automation, and they want to be the number one player there. Is there a chance some of the technology from that acquisition could help robotics and automation in other parts of Amazon? Perhaps, but I don't think that's the main play here for Amazon. Well, Jason, I know you know that space so well, but Ray, I want to bring you in on Amazon's overall strategy to improve margins because robotics is just one small slice of that pie. What else can you tell us about Amazon's overall strategy to bump up returns? Yeah, if you think about what's going on here, I mean, there's a labor cost that's driving everything. And so anything from autonomous vehicles, anything for the ability to do pick, pack and ship, um, really what you're trying to do is figure out how to solve the supply chain and logistics aspect. And the more you put automation, the more you pull AI in place, it allows you to go from human scale to machine scale. And that's really why it's so important to be able to actually think about, right, every process, every opportunity for automation. And of course, it does take a lot of time, like Ali was saying, because to get from 80% to 90%, that's as just as hard as it's to get from 90% to 95%. And each of those incremental improvements, just as a result of time and iteration. Um, the other piece that's actually you're seeing is that's just the back end of the operations. The front end of the operations are coming from AI and getting better understanding of what customers want. And so if you get the demand and the supply together and you shape that properly, you can actually improve margins, you can reduce the number of returns, and you can actually get better at pricing. So Amazon obviously isn't the only company that has access to the tools that you're talking about. Jason, I think a lot about a company like Walmart heading into earnings this week, the biggest grocer in the country. To what extent could Walmart leverage robotics either through innovation or acquisitions like we've seen to compete with an Amazon? 
Yeah, I think the important thing for a company like Walmart is to use robotics, you know, to to increase the advantage that they may already have over more pure play e-commerce players like Amazon. And that's really the immediacy of their stores, the ability to order and pick up the same day or have delivery from stores the same day. And so they bought a company called Alert Innovation. They have a system called Al Alphabot that is a retrieval and um, a storage and retrieval system that is built onto the side of a store to help workers um, more quickly pick and pack uh, orders that can be either picked up or delivered that same very same day. And so this is a huge opportunity for them. Um, they need to invest heavily, but yet, you know, they don't have the margins of an AWS helping them. They're starting to build an advertising business that has great margin, but it's much smaller than Amazon. So it'll be interesting to see how aggressively they can spend to ramp up. Uh, they have a long way to go. Now, Ray, robotics won't just impact company to company competition. You're expecting it to impact geopolitical competition. How might robotics transform the US-China dynamic moving forward? Oh, it's a big factor, right? I mean, think about China, their population dynamics are shrinking over time. They need robots to be able to keep up. They're going to look like Japan in 20 years in terms of their age demographic. Uh, and you're going to see a lot more of that automation that's going to come into place. In the U.S., at least, we still have immigration and a good supply of labor, uh, even though it's been very, very tight. Uh, and in terms of competition, we actually have to be able to catch up from anything from automating the way ports operate to automating what actually happens in the last mile in terms of the distribution, in terms of transportation management, and warehouse management. Those are coming into play. And I think that's really the, the big competition is really our ability to actually move more goods more quickly and be able to do it at lower cost and be able to take up, take advantage of more cycles uh, that are being offered when we get to automation. Because automation allows you to get the 24 seven, the robots play a key role in doing that. And whoever can actually compete more quickly to be able to do that is going to win in the geopolitical wars. So Ray, I want to stick with you here for our audience of investors listening. What would you say are the publicly traded robotics companies that investors need to be looking out for? Yeah, there's three that I look at, and I think ABB is the one there. They've been leading in this space for quite some time. FANUC is another one where you're actually seeing a lot of automation, not just in warehouses, but also in manufacturing, and also SMC. Uh, SMC Corp. These three companies are leading in the space, uh, but more importantly, these are publicly traded companies. There's also a number of companies that are not publicly traded that are actually have a lot of innovations in that marketplace. A lot of developments there to watch. Thank you so much for joining us. We had Ray Wan and Jason Del Rey, and of course, a huge thanks to our own Ali Garfinkel.
Few words are as emotive in American discourse today as healthcare. It's an industry and a system that both insiders and patients agree is broken. From affordability and access to the government's drug pricing negotiations, the challenges are endless. Meanwhile, big box and digital health are pressuring traditional systems. Companies like Amazon and Walmart are thinking about how to get you to think about healthcare while you're shopping. Then there's the excitement and apprehension around AI and what its role is in healthcare. And of course, the buzz surrounding the newest weight loss and diabetes drugs and what it means for other industries. We'll tackle all this and more in a special series starting November 13th, only on Yahoo Finance. Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. from the new studio here at Yahoo Brand Finance studio Live. I know, still pulling some of the covers off of things here. Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith and our executive editor, Brian Sazi. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here is your morning rundown. Stocks jump as inflation cools in October. Falling gas prices help the number, but rent is still a big problem. The core figure also coming in below estimates. Is the disinflation story back on track for the Fed? That's the big question. And Home Depot beating in its recent quarter, but the rest of the year isn't looking so rosy. The retailer narrowing its guidance for the full fiscal year. We are across the big consumer story today. And President Biden will meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping tomorrow as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation that gets underway in San Francisco. It's a crucial meeting for investors the world over. 
Well, we've got a lot that we're watching here today. Today's top story, inflation continues to moderate thanks to the help of falling gas prices. Consumer prices only rose 3.2% in the last year, a deceleration from the previous month. Rent, however, is still a big problem. Shelter costs pinching consumers' wallets. That's up 6.7% in the last tier year. A lot to break down here, but still, very sticky inflation on the housing front, the biggest additive to this inflation print this most recent month. Yeah, certainly. And when we look at what is happening with shelter right now, offsetting maybe some of the progress that we are seeing when it comes to energy prices. We have been talking a lot here at Yahoo Finance about the fact that gas prices have been declining over the last several weeks. And we're seeing that reflected in the CPI print here this morning. Energy costs giving some inf uh, disinflationary pressure, I should say. The in energy index pulling two and a half percent over the month, a 5% decline in the gas index. So offsetting maybe some of the increases that we did see elsewhere within uh, the energy uh, component indexes here. But certainly a good step forward. What this means, though, in the overall scheme of things, as we do certainly still have rising uh, pressures on prices in a number of other areas, obviously still a real concern here for consumers. You know what burns my britches here? We just saw the futures absolutely uh, really skyrocket after this report, feeding that narrative uh, that we might see disinflation, the Fed dials back its rates, and maybe they cut rates next year. Whatever the case is, but I, what bothers me is you dig into the CPI report and it continues to paint a picture of struggling U.S. consumers. Four of six major grocery store food group indexes increased month over month. Scroll down even further on the bottom release, you see cereal prices up, egg prices up. To me, I think the consumer remains under a lot of pressure. I think there's a lot of concern about how this holiday shopping season may turn out. I take this CPI report, I bolt it onto what I heard from Home Depot this morning, and I'm concerned. And I know the market doesn't care about this stuff, but maybe it should care. The consumer powers this economy, and to me, this consumer is under a lot of pressure. The market's looking past it right now, right? But I think the question is how long can this type of trend continue, right? We know the consumer obviously so critical here when we talk about the overall health of the economy, but especially, Sazi, like you were just saying, right now heading into the holiday season. Lots of questions just about what the spending patterns, how willing the consumer is going to be to spend this holiday season, what they are going to be spending on. We heard from Home Depot this morning. We'll get a better look at some of the retailers over the next several days when we get more results. But I think that is the big question here, right? Yes, we are seeing some progress in certain areas of this CPI print, but still very clearly when you take a look at food alone, we certainly are still seeing pretty, uh, a lot of pressure, obviously, that's still being exerted on the consumer on an everyday basis. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to dive more into that housing sector for sure here, especially given the results that we just got from Home Depot. One area, though, that I do want to call out before we move on, though, airline fares. The index for airline fares actually declined nine-tenths of a percent here, and this really harkens back to something that we heard from Delta CEO Ed Bastian when he joined us in studio last week, talking about where they are beginning to see some weakness across the lower income levels. That is one of, and and in terms of the revenge travel, saying that we're past that in that conversation that we had with him last week. And so that's one area that we could continue to see this show up in the data and in the details here. And some of the other data points here that did see an increase here in prices. New vehicles was up 1.9%. That's on a that's on a yearly basis compared Not EV, to a year Shana. ago. Nobody's buying an EV. Come no on. one's buying well, an <laughs> Right, because Care people can't EVs. afford them. Because people don't have the money can't, to go Can't pay the bills to charge these things. Exactly. Cereal prices up 4.2%. It. Yes. I could take my extra 10% uh, higher box of cereal and go into an Ed Bastion flown plane. What kind of cereal are you getting? Uh, I'm still a rice checks guy. Yeah, I really? know it's, it may seem boring on the surface, it but is. there's something crunchy about way. that cereal and you put it in the milk. It's just so good. It's good. I'll pay more for it. Cinnamon Toast Crunch all day. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is so good. All right, guys, let's get to some of our trending tickers ahead of the open. Home Depot beat analyst expectations in its third quarter. It did, however, see its comparable sales fall 3.1% in the quarter as they continue to see pressure in big-ticket discretionary purchases. Now, the home improvement retailer also narrowing its guidance for the full fiscal year. When we talk about that guidance, that's one of the uh, key points in this report that I wanted to focus in on because, yes, we did see Home Depot narrow its guidance. There was a certain, to a certain degree, expectation on the street that we could see the guidance cut. So the fact that we did not see Home Depot lower its guidance, I guess that's good news, at least for now. We're seeing the move to the upside here out of the open just about 3%. But it's all about what people are spending and the fact that they aren't really willing to buy those big ticket items given the pricing pressure that they're seeing. Yeah, these appliance prices are up a lot and put them on a, a Home Depot credit card. I, there's a, That's a real cost. But you know, days like this, I miss not being a stock analyst because I would put out a note here. 
uh, going up against my competitors saying this quarter, it just wasn't that good. Sure, inventory was down $3 billion year over year, and that's great. There's no glut going into the holiday season for Home Depot, but scroll down. Uh, gross margins down, operating profits down, net earnings down, customer transactions down, average ticket down, sales per retail square foot down. This tells me that the consumer that goes to Home Depot has pulled back. Higher interest rates are impacting them. And for me, I just, I continue to be, I'm negative this morning, guys. I'm really just negative on the health of the consumer. I think interest rates are really starting to influence a lot of households, and it shows up in this Home Depot report. Well, it just, re it just continues to illustrate a retailer that is going to succumb to the pressure, unfortunately, of low replenishment rates for some of the most costly items out there. Nobody needs three or four lawnmowers. You only need maybe two refrigerators. Well, you need an electric one. You need a gas one. I don't. I'm sorry. Don't I don't even one. have a lawn. I don't, I don't, I don't have, have a home. I don't have a home. I don't have a home. I don't need any lawnmowers. And so no here, lawnmowers. you know, consider this. At the time where you've already seen rising mortgage rates, according to the NAHB, push housing affordability to its lowest index in history since they've been tracking it since 2012 here. One of the huge things to remember here is that more people, if they are already already looking at their home equivalent rent or just looking at what they're paying in their mortgage rate right now and seeing that continue to tick up, which according to this data, mortgage rates currently near 8%. Builder surveys indicate that market conditions going to remain challenging through the end of the year. And meanwhile, average mortgage rates jumped from 6.59% in the second quarter up to 7.13% in the third quarter. That means you're paying more on a monthly basis. And at the same time, you're probably not going to be spending on a lot of the house renovations that you would have done even if you are staying in that home for longer. Yeah. And I mean, when we talk about a lot of the challenges, you brought up a lot of great points, right? None of those are going anywhere anytime soon, right? right. We talk about the yeah. fact that there's so much uncertainty ahead. There's lots of pressure here on the consumer. The fact that people simply cannot afford to maybe do, even if it's smaller renovations, right. they're not able to do that given the fact that they're paying your 8% for mortgage I, rates. I do so, want one of those blow-up Santas. Yeah, I don't have a home, but I just want to stick one of those on the lawn. Those 10-foot blow-up We had a blow-up blow skeleton Santas. for Halloween. That's yeah, pretty cool. You didn't send me a picture of that. What's up oh, with yeah, that? You're skeleton on, my on a bike. Oh, okay, well, send me a picture. And it was moving. Well, a lot of the EV dealerships might not need the little blow-up doll with the wavy hands <laughs> I love and everything. those. I'm a so sucker for those. We'll, we'll just go, so uh, we'll so go poach one of those uh, for real, you. Real quickly, too, uh, this Home Depot quarter, Macy's reports later this week, that report's going to stink. I'm okay. just saying it right now. Right. We're going to be watching for it. <laughs> We're also looking at shares of Fisker extending losses in pre-market trading after reporting a huge revenue miss in the third quarter results. The electric vehicle startup also slashed its full-year production forecast as it struggles to ramp up deliveries to the U.S. This comes as other EV makers like Tesla, GM, Lucid, they have warned of slowdowns in the market. Tesla CEO Elon Musk pointing to higher rates as one of the contributing factors in the company's latest earnings call. You're taking a look at shares of Fisker, ticker symbol FSR here this morning, taking a hit on the head. It's down by about 17% here in pre-market trading. And one of the huge things to watch, of course, is the continued price wars, but also how much that is going to impact margins. And at the same time, you've got to be delivering producing and delivering vehicles. And that's where if you're not a Tesla, if you're not a Lucid, even if you are a Lucid, you've struggled with that delivery and then production as well on the same side. Does Fisker need to be in this market? And it's not, I'm not trying to be flippant. Uh, you have a, you have a, but we have uh, a major ramp up in EV production in this country, Ford, General Motors, and they're not putting out garbage. These are credible cars with strong mileage or, or range capabilities, amazing in-feature uh, technology. You have Polestar out there, I think, grabbing a lot of market share. Tesla doing what Tesla does, now trying to lower the cost of its production. So we come out with more, I think, cheaper vehicles, the Cybertruck. I just don't know where Fisker plays in this market longer term. And if it does, and I look at the finances of this company, here's a company in the past three months that blew through almost $305 million in cash. And I think you're looking at Fisker next year and why the market remains so concerned and why you're seeing the stock down almost 20%. There's probably liquidity concerns uh, regarding Fisker. Now, they, I think they noted on this release that they have $650 million in total liquidity. But at some point, to bring that vision to life by Henrik Fisker, they're going to need another capital raise. And at what point does that person or that bank say, we're not giving you this capital, it's a Tesla market and we don't really care what you're doing? And they're struggling already, right? We talk about a lot of the fact that production supply, that has obviously been a massive issue, not just for Fisker, but for so many of the smaller players within the EV market, just simply because of how much it costs to produce an EV. So here you have some of the reaction on the street this morning and a lot of that being tied back to deliveries and mm -hmm. their potential here to ramp. Uh, Morgan Stanley, Adam Jonas there, one of those analysts weighing in right away on this report saying that ocean deliveries are ramping, but so is 
its inventory. Obviously not something that Fisker wants to see at this time. Looking ahead, he's saying that the direction of the stock is going to be driven by their ability to ramp ocean deliveries. Does, does Tying that, it does, all back to demand. Does he have a Fisker? Does whether or not that's there. Do we know? It. He never comes on with us. What's with this guy? What's with this guy? Yeah. Come on with us, Adam Jones. I bet you he's probably a Tesla. Probably a tennis guy. Tesla. No. Yeah. Maybe he drives a Ford pickup yeah, truck, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people do. Uh, look, just key to remember here, this was a company that went public via SPAC. Um, of course, the kind of marker to remember that they go public at, or at least that the SPAC uh, and then the DSPAC takes place at $10 usually. And then this company traded eventually as high as $28.50 a share. You look at it today, it's trading at about $3.39 before the market opens. Certainly some downward pressure there on that stock. All right, let's talk about another name that we're watching, Hun Hai, the main public arm of Foxconn Technology, warning that its revenue is going to decline for the third quarter in a row. Now, this comes after the world's largest assembler of iPhones reported its Q3 earnings this week. The Taiwan-based company also lowering its outlook to flat for its components of business after previously forecasting growth. Now, demand for the new iPhone falling in China this year and Foxconn getting more than half of its business from Apple. What does this all mean for Apple's outlook? Of course, that is the big question that many analysts here in the U.S. are asking about this. The fact that we did see disappointing guidance here from the company, what exactly that tells us about demand or lack thereof, a waning demand for the all-new iPhone 15. You got it. I got it. This thing You're is one of the people great. That, yeah. That's it? It, ha- it did get hot this morning when I was charging it up, but uh, you know, it, 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 didn't, it, didn't, it didn't blow up and it didn't go into flames, so I think I'm okay. So net positive. <laughs> yeah, net positive. But I, I am interested in this story. I was joking around with our team that, and you know, I, I was initially met on this story because we know Apple isn't necessarily knocking the cover off the ball with these new iPhones. So we know that. Um, so no real surprises to me. I think for Apple, what's next? You know, what's that next catalyst that can drive this stock even higher? You know, I was just marveling at the, the new mountain stock feature on our newly relaunched website. And you can see that Apple shares are really having difficulty retesting those September highs. And I think there has to be another new product out for Apple uh, to get past that high. It, it just I'm looking for a catalyst and I just don't feel it. Well, this is still supposed to be a year where Apple is expected to see its highest level, and we talk about this all the time, of their overall market share for the global smartphone and ecosystem market right now. 19.9% is what was projected by IDC. We'll see if they get to that figure. We should also mention that in the figures that we were showing, the actuals versus the estimates for Foxconn in this most recent results, don't be alarmed if you saw trillion next to that. It's actually about 47.71 billion U.S. dollars that you're taking a look at. So we've got the new Taiwan dollars, which is what they reported in on your screen. Just key to note there. Uh, so didn't want to alarm any viewers out there. But it's still, it comes back to being an Apple story. And Brad, I, I, yeah. will, I will add this too. Apple's lost the narrative. So I, I know what NVIDIA is working on. News out at what, yesterday evening, amazing new chip. I know Microsoft is getting ready for their Ignite conference. They're probably going to talk about their relationship with chat GPT. And earlier this week, Sam Altman uh, over at uh, OpenAI talking about some new things coming from them. And of course, Microsoft has that stake or that investment with them. So there's reasons for other, I think there's just reasons for investors to be excited about other plays in tech than Apple right now. Now, not to say that Apple's not working on innovative things, of course, it's Apple, but everything else seems a lot sexier than Apple. Well, they also are not as much of a cheerleader of their own innovation as much as they have been in the past. And the reason I say that, Tim Cook is far more operationally minded and almost channels a Bruno Mars, don't believe me, just watch type of mentality. (laughs) Which has worked. It has worked. worked. It's worked for Bruno. It's worked for Bruno. Exactly. So Apple kind of channeling that same uh, sentiment, if you will, when they bring Well, they were trying to sell the services story. Obviously, everyone though we know how important and critical the hardware side of the business is. So they need to continue to pivot away from that in terms of the selling and getting that message out there. All right, well, let's look beyond stocks for a moment. Gold prices in focus. They traded in both directions after this morning's inflation data with U.S. futures holding around a 1950 per ounce. What does the latest CPI print mean for gold? We want to head over to Jared Blickery, who has a closer look at some of the action that we're seeing uh, right now. Jared. Yeah, so no inflation. You would think, well, gold's in inflation head might be going down. Uh, It did go down just right when the report hit, but that was one of those low liquidity spikes looking for GC equals F. There we go right there. And uh, this is a line chart. You can see on a candlestick, uh, let's see a two-day chart here, how it dipped below, but then it quickly recovered. And you can see we're actually holding around 1962 right now. Now, in a longer-term view, we have been flirting with the 2000 level. Put a line chart right back. For some time, 2050 is really the breakout level. 
Uh, I was talking to uh, Ms. Schneider a few weeks ago on this program. She's looking for 3,000, but she got to clear 2,050 first, and there's a lot going on here. Um, I just want to get back to some of the, the largest marginal purchasers of gold besides people, besides the retail public, is central banks. Now, this is a chart I was showing this last week, goes back to 2010. Uh, this year, we are only through Q3. That's as of uh, the third quarter of this year, so we could easily top last year's record. Uh, interesting to think who's doing that. It's China. It's Russia. They have been de-dollarizing for some time. Um, and then I, I want to talk about the interest rate structure. We saw a huge drop in the 10-year Tino. We'll see if I have time to get to that in a second. But over the long term, gold has really uh, come unhinged from the bond market. This chart goes back 20 years. Here's gold prices in Cyan. Here's the inverse tips rate. Not going not to get into the wonky bond stuff just now, but suffice to say this morning is going in the right direction. It would close this gap from the, from the yield perspective. Now, let me finish up here and look at the 10-year T-note yield. Uh, it was down as many as 15 basis points, which is a huge move for this instrument, especially off of a report like this. And uh, it looks like stocks are really loving this. Here's the 10-year T-note yield back down below 4.5%. That is a huge psychological number there. The lower that goes, the more it helps out stocks. So not surprisingly, we got a big spike up on the announcement. I'm just going to leave you with the, excuse me, the Russell 2000. The small caps are up 3.6%, the best morning in literally months, guys. Lovely work there. That's gold, Jared. Gold. Thanks yes. so much for joining us here in studio, as always. <laughs> on the other side of the break, the opening bell on Wall Street, how markets are reacting to the latest inflation print. That's next.
Santa Rally trying to make an early appearance this year, but the big question, can it hold options? Market says yes, with calls on the rise and some influential market voices also sounding bullish on U.S. equities. All this despite some very real geopolitical and economic headwinds on our radar. Our next guest, he's in constructive most of the year, but where are, there, where are the pockets that he's looking at and how things stand today? For that, we want to bring in Max Kettner. He's HSBC Chief Multi-Asset Strategist. Max, it's good to see you. So we got this inflation print this morning. We're obviously seeing a reaction here in the pre-market ahead of the open. Does this further prove that maybe there is more upside before the end of the year? Oh, yes, absolutely. And thanks for having me. Uh, yes, I do think so, right? I think this is sort of not the all clear for a year-end rally, right? There may be some some things still happening, fine. But I think at December, rate tiger is pretty much off the table for the Fed, right? And there is no real reason for the Fed to sound particularly overly hawkish now, right? So uh, I think, you know, when we look at today, it's as Goldilocks as it can possibly get, right? Like, it, it, it feels much more a bit like... What do you actually want to sell now, right? Like, if, if you do asset allocation like myself, it's a bit like, oof, what do, what do we want to be underweight, right? It's, it feels a bit more like, okay, um, in, in terms of the preferences, I still like the US, I still like tech, I still like growth. Absolutely, yes. Does, but uh, the biggest, right, the biggest risk for us was really a continued overheating of the US economy and an uptick in inflation. And that's just not happening. It's the opposite. And that, that's really, really good. So if today's CPI print is the first sign of a, a true move towards the inflation target that the Fed has put out there and uh, a, a real step in making sure that we can eventually get towards a cut at some point, then does that signal to you for the markets rally on? And, and if so, where? And are we erasing some of the declines that we had seen in full uh, that started late summer? Uh, oh, yes, I think so. I think that's that's easily possible over the next couple of months, because uh, when we think about the next couple of months or let's say the next sort of until the the uh, first half of next year, look, what we're seeing is an environment where uh, inflation is probably going to dip a bit further. Right. So you can see you don't have to be wildly optimistic to say you can see core PCE inflation, like core inflation in the U.S. below three percent by sort of April, May next year. Right. And at the same time, people aren't really particularly optimistic on growth either, right? If we look at, for example, things like uh, earnings growth forecasts for the S&P, consensus earnings growth forecasts, then, you know, the con consensus is now positioned for quite a dramatic decline in the fourth quarter and even a decline in the first quarter on a sequential basis, right? So consensus is actually saying that earnings for the S&P are going to drop now from this Q3 reporting season to Q4 by around $3, which would be around, you know, a bit more than 6% quarter over quarter drop. And even in Q1, consensus is saying, we're not going to be back to the earnings where we just have seen, um, seen in, in Q3. So expectations, not only on the, on the inflation and the rate side are important, but expectations on the earnings side, equally so, are really, really quite pessimistic for the near term. And that's great, right? It allows for continued sort of positive surprises, such as we've seen on inflation, mm -hmm. but also positive surprises on the earnings and the growth side. Both of that means Goldilocks, it means overweight US stocks, it means overweight tech, it means overweight consumer discretionary, right? It's, it's an environment where really the growth factor should continue to outperform. Uh, Max, as we, I think, could both agree on, nothing goes up in a straight line. What do you think could blow up this FOMO trade? Yeah, look, I guess um, it, it's one of the questions that we get the most, right? Because people don't like being uh, overly optimistic, su such as ourselves, uh, this year. Um, but I think the biggest risk is not actually the recession risk. Because let's face it, when we look at particularly aggregate sentiment from the largest asset managers, right? So how the large asset managers worldwide are thinking. On aggregate, they're underweight equities, they're underweight high yield credit, they're overweight sovereign bonds. So they are positioned for some sort of really material slowdown in growth. So to me, that's not the risk. The risk is that we're going to start to see something, uh, you know, something similar to the third quarter where growth is going into overheating territory. Why is that so, so dangerous? Because it means the long end of the yield curve spikes again, the dollar spikes again. And those two things, right, real rates up, the long end up long in volatility in rates, particularly up, and the dollar stronger. No asset class likes that, right? The big risk is on that, 
because it, it's the overheating that really then makes all the asset classes across the board sell off. Max Kedner, who is the chief multi-asset strategist over at HSBC Global. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. Appreciate it, Max. Well, B of A's global fund manager survey is in. The top line, bonds have more fun. But there's a lot more to it than that. On policy, it sees 76% saying the Fed hiking cycle is over. On macro, it shows investors expecting weaker global growth. So let's get the full breakdown with Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer. Josh, what are the charts saying to us right now? Yeah, Brad. So obviously you noted off the top there, bonds really stick out here. And I want to just point out a couple charts that we have. So investors are now the most overweight on bonds that we've seen since the great financial crisis. You can see there we've really only seen investors be overweight on bonds a couple times over the last decade. But this chart just sticks out to me because what have we been talking about a lot over the last month and a half, two months now, we've been talking about bond yields rising, right? And at what point can bonds actually catch a bid as those yields pick up, it seems like that moment might start to be right now and people are starting to come to the table and say, you know what, close to a 5% a five percent yield on the 10-year maybe isn't so bad. Above a 5% yield on that 30-year for a little bit wasn't too bad and people actually turning and starting to be overweight and buy bonds, which we just clearly had not seen over the past couple of months. When we talk about the sentiment right now towards equities, there was also something notable within this report in terms of the optimism that we're starting to see from Wall Street, from investors, in terms of the direction that we could see stocks go in here going forward. Yeah, investors turning positive on equities. They're the most positive they've been since April of 2022. And really, sometimes you can see this as two ways, right? There's the Investors are positive on equities, which can be a good thing, obviously. It's a good time, but then there are also sort of the inverse indicators that people point to where if investors are now positive on equities, maybe that actually means it's time to sell, right? Which there are always indicators that say that. But I think overall, the takeaway for me from this survey, when you look at the next chart that I brought with us here, is the conviction that the Fed is done and people are ready to turn more bullish on equities. They think yields are gonna fall. They think inflation's gonna come down and just sort of the sentiment we've seen in the market expressed in this survey, the sentiment we've seen in the last two weeks and the sentiment we're seeing. It's today. like Max Kettner just said, he called it the Goldilocks yeah. setup. And, and mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just surprised to see this. Just getting, you dig into this inflation report today, just I think uh, prices remain high and just amazing that the Fed is going to potentially cut rates in June. I just, I can't wrap my heads around them. Yeah, but I think it was just the fact that the trend stayed intact, right? We are right. still seeing some disinflationary pressures across the board, not across the board, but in some particular uh, aspects of this in terms of where we are seeing some uh, pressure, I guess, start to alleviate specifically, obviously, in energy. We did see also some relief when it comes to auto sales, what we're seeing there, auto prices, I should say. But in terms of what this means for the Fed, I also think that the Fed obviously has an extremely tough job right now because they don't want to be too dovish or signal anything in terms of investors interpret, interpreting them too dovish. They have to remain hawkish in terms of their rhetoric, but they also got to walk that fine line and make sure that they don't go too far. And then the potential repercussions that we've been talking to with a couple of our chief economists this morning and also strategists just in terms of what that could mean then over the next several months. Yeah, and those indexes that did see declines lodging away from home. So all of those accommodations companies that we've been speaking to, you spoke to Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano at Yahoo Finance Invest just last week. Lodging away from home, that's involved in that. Used cars and trucks, you got to finance one of those purchases. You think about communication, we're listening for any signs of delinquency among consumers as well. And then lastly here, airline fares, which CEO Ed Bastian just told us last week that they're already starting to see that the pent up revenge travel has clearly already peaked and is behind us. So now what does normalization look like going forward from here? I don't know. We all got to try to figure <laughs> yeah. that out. What does normalization look like? Question. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. That is a great question. All right, Josh, thanks so much for joining us here. All right, we've got the opening bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the markets. We're still seeing uh, some movement here in the pre-market. If that is futures, we were significantly higher earlier. Jo uh, Jared Blickery standing by with a closer look at what we are seeing right now at the open. Jared. That's right. We're seeing a nice pop here. Looks like the Nasdaq hasn't opened just yet, but the Dow is up 1%. Let's get a two-day view here so we can see that nice pop on that inflation report this morning. Uh, also, just a side note, for all the talk about Supercore, that dropped from six-tenths of a percent month over month to two-tenths of a percent. So even that statistic, probably one of the most important ones that the Federal Reserve looks at, that is right there as well. 
Uh, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. That came in up almost 2% now. By the way, Russell 2000 having its best day in months. And let's take a look at the bond market here because we got a huge drop. Uh, this is uh, the tenure is down below 4.5%, down 17 basis points. Uh, I think that's the most it's dropped since May or so of this year. And you can really see the drop on a three-month candlestick chart. We had all this potential support right here at 4.5%. And guess what? We just crashed right through it in the mor this morning. And that does have important implications for stocks. It's stock friendly. Here is the VIX. The VIX is moving south right now, has a 14 handle. Looks like it's ready to drop to 13 and change. We'll have to see if that happens, but that would be the lowest uh, level since September. And all of this is against the backdrop of equities and the uh, bullish seasonality that we have in this third year of the presidential cycle going into year end. We don't ever go in a straight line, but uh, that is the tendency and it looks like stocks, especially with the bond market finally behaving, the, the uh, path of least resistance is definitely up here. Now, interest rate sensitivity in the real estate sector, uh, XLRE is loving that. It's up 4%, followed by consumer discretionary, followed by utilities, another interest rate sensitive sector, and then materials, communication services, and tech. So interestingly, it looks like uh, NASDAQ 100 ought to be looking pretty good right now. And we'll see as these quotes move in. There you go. Apple up 1%. So is Microsoft. Alphabet nearly 2 Amazon, same boat. And Tesla, Tesla up 4%. I was just taking a look at our EV board, seeing some real outperformance here, even among the traditional auto makers, GM up 2.5%, so is Ford, and some of the Chinese names like Xpeng up about 5.65%, guys. Lots of green on the screen, at least right now here at the Open. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Let's talk about some of the other gainers that we're seeing this morning. Kraft Heinz getting an upgrade this morning from Bernstein. Now the team there upgrading the stock from perform to outperform. They also raised their price target to 40 bucks a share. You can see the stock opening just below 34 bucks a share. Now the company, at least in Bernstein's view, is in a good position to com compare to peers and also a very cheap valuation. Bernstein also saying that it's not worried about the weight loss drugs impacting the company and their sales, considering its protein forward portfolio. At least that's a take here from Bernstein. We talked about the fact that these weight loss drugs have been weighing on some of these consumer staples names. You're, what are you laughing about? The pr protein portfolio? Protein forward <laughs> portfolio. Look, Kraft Heinz has done some very good work the past two years, stripping out costs, realigning mm. its business under now former CEO uh, Miguel Patricio, new CEO in there, Carlos uh, uh, Rivera Abrams, uh, doing his thing at the company. He just recently started. Bottom line is, this is a more efficiently well-run company, and there is a compelling case, and I think what that's what they're trying to highlight here. Stock is yielding close to seven, uh, 5 percent. That's yeah. the dividend yield. You go onto the Yahoo Finance uh, revamp website, you can see it's trading about 11 times forward earnings, a well below market multiple on a company that I think still has a lot of runway to pull out costs from its business, and they're also driving a lot of invention or reinvention of the core portfolio, rethinking uh, how products should, and then uh, also as well how they are marketed to uh, custom consumers. I mean, it should be no surprise that there is interest or at least some question around the volume in the meats category for Kraft Heinz. This came up on the call. They talked about on volume where there is uh, this drag that meats has presented in this most recent quarter. And they, it, and they address that to a certain extent, especially within the U.S. business where they're making some significant investments in terms of improving share of shelf, marketing, investment and innovation. I don't know what meat innovation looks like from here. We've already got fake meats out there. A lot so. of meat innovation, yeah. Well, I mean, what go, what huh? is next? What is next in meat innovation? I don't know. Perhaps I, I actually don't have a good answer for you on that. But uh, <laughs> staying on the topic of meat, to make it our very own. If Brooke you did, De we could start a company. Our, our very own Brooke De Palma had an exclusive with Tyson CEO yesterday. That's on the, the Yahoo Finance homepage. And then you know his that CEO is saying consumers now trading down to chicken from beef. So just continuing my own narrative here this morning that the consumer is not in good shape, that they're now, they can't afford, can't afford beef, and now they're trading back down to chicken. Is chicken even cheaper? Chicken's a lot cheaper. It's cheaper. Yeah, it's a heck of a lot cheaper, so it makes sense, right? You talk about the fact that people, their grocery bills are going up, they're trying to save yeah. where they can. I actually do buy chicken sometimes <laughs> instead of beef because it is. You do save a lot of money when it comes to that, especially some of the higher end uh, beef prices there. So some savvy shopping by you. Savvy shopping. Double S. Always, okay. always. I'm very frugal. I'm always looking to save a buck or two. But obviously, this all comes back to the consumer, what this means here for spending going forward. Kraft, at least in Bernstein's eyes, they think they're well positioned. A lot of that, obviously, with the valuation. Mac and cheese is so good. 
mac and cheese. Uh, okay. That's another uh, statement. Uh, I don't know about Three that. You cannot make that statement about mac and cheese and it being good from a package when you've got Thanksgiving this close. That's and we've right. got fresh mac well, and you're cheese. You're a chef. You, 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 nobody, mm, we, the world doesn't know that about you. Well, and that's why I'm still cooking beef because it's <laughs> Also, On Running is racing towards the 2023 finish line, increasing its outlook through the end of the year. The apparel company is increasing its outlook on net sales and gross profit margin. Compared to last year, last quarter's net sales increased over 57%. This is the company's seventh consecutive record top line quarter. Uh, it's been a big time period for running to pr to prove as the CEOs of, of New Balance as well as uh, Brooks Running have told us that running is recession res recession resilient. This is the time for that to be proven. Uh, this company, the market needs to get off the back of this company. Mark Marr and uh, his co-CEO, Martin Hoffman, are very, very strong operators. They've been on our network numerous times since the IPO, and all they have done over this period of time is aggressively expanded distribution. They have not taken product quality out this is, and they've now started to roll out apparel throughout um, various lines uh, of their business. But the market is focused on two things off of this quarter and why you're seeing the stock under pressure. Never good things necessarily to see with the retailer. Inventory up 62% year over year. Sales were up 58%. Anytime it's a retailer, you see inventory outpacing sales. It's a reason to throw a little bit of a red flag onto the field. Mm -hmm. And then secondarily, fourth quarter guidance uh, looking like uh, On is calling for up high single digit percentage sales growth in the wholesale business. Otherwise, uh, let's say department stores. You put those two things together, the market may be reading a little bit of a slowdown, increased competition for some of the brands that you noted. But by and large, this is a very well run company that uh, has put up a series of good quarters. The market is just fixated on those two numbers right now, though. Yeah, revenue jumping 61% in the Americas, 72% in Asia Pacific. You mentioned that inventory number. And remember what happened last holiday season when it came to these on running shoes? You didn't see a heck of a lot of sales because they were doing very well. They weren't forced to promote or have as much promotional activity as many of their yeah. rivals did. It will be interesting to see exactly what that looks like this current quarter and whether they are able to still stir some this of This stuff demand. ain't on sale. I was looking to get a pair of new Ons. No, no, exactly. They're, they're not on they're, sale. They're $170 a pop, yeah. right? This is real money. That's and real money. It. Well, and I mean, that's the biggest thing too right now and the price point that they're all competing at because we heard from Brooks Running what their popular price points are. A lot of these are in kind of that midpoint of $150 right now, which just goes to show how much, even for a premium running product, consumers are will, still willing to spend. However, in the competitive landscape, that's where you've got to lean towards where there is so much popularity, especially among, among that younger consumer cohort too. New Balance CEO told us they had the best back to school season that they had seen in the company's history, this most recent one. So that spells out trouble for a company that is trying to take on more share of shelf in places like Finish Line, in places like Foot Locker, as on running is. As much as they've got some great innovation that they were able to bring to the market, it's still uh, a story of a marathon, if you will, and not a sprint, even if you are able to maintain some fanfare in one season. These shoes, just they just hug my feet very nice. I just like them. My I mean, husband just, likes them too. Yeah, I got them for, that was nice. his Christmas gift last year and they were not on sale. Yeah, you, didn't get so. him, you didn't get him chicken? You got, you got, you know. We didn't get him chicken. I saved <laughs> I, I traded down, I bought chicken. Happy so holidays, here's some chicken. <laughs> the on shoes the that were weekly. not on sale. Hopefully personally this year, I'm hoping to find a few more sales when it comes on running, but it doesn't sound like it. it looks like the demand at least is pretty strong here. All right, we are going to leave that conversation there for now, but lower fuel prices, cooling inflation in October, but what's in store for the oil markets in the months ahead? We will break all of that down. Don't go anywhere. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. 
and we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. The International Energy Agency has lifted its oil demand growth forecast for this year and next, thanks to surprisingly strong demand from China and the U.S. IEA also noting that concerns around supply in the Middle East have eased, despite ongoing conflict in the region, though noting that the situation could quickly change. Oil prices have retreated from the near record highs in early October, fueled by concerns in the Middle East. The lift coming just a day after OPEC raised its 2023 growth forecast, though it left its 2024 forecast unchanged. With more, we want to bring in Vikas Dwavidi. He's a global energy strategist with Macquarie. It's great to see you here, Vikas. Thanks so much for joining us on our new set in studio. So let's talk about what's ahead for the oil market, because I think there's lots of questions, just exactly what prices are going to look like going forward. And you take a look at where things are today, much lower. We have oil just below 80 bucks a barrel, much lower than maybe we had braced ourselves for, given the conflict that started just over a month ago. So what does this tell us then about the prices between now and year end? Yeah, what we think it tells us is that this market is uh, not as excited about paying for conflict mm -hmm. and the potential supply disruptions that mm -hmm. come with wars and other types of disruptions because um, over the past several episodes of big breakout issues, um, supply has not been disrupted. Right. So I think that's why we saw a very limited response once the Middle East tensions really broke out and then it didn't even keep that limited response. It kind of gave it all back and then some. Right. Um, the market is also grappling with how um, much OPEC production and how much OPEC supply is actually making it out to the marketplace. The cuts were real. I think they still are real, but there seems to be slippage and there seems to be more oil in the market than the cuts would have implied. To what extent are you anticipating that the, the supply issues would continue to be a headwind risk for inflation as well? Yeah, that is a, it's a risk. Um, but we have been on the view that um, oil supply is plentiful. The underinvestment thesis that so many have been uh, thinking is the state of affairs, we have disagreed with that. We think the market has invested enough in oil supply. 
and supply can respond to prices. So we don't believe oil will be a big factor in um, inflation. You know, it is a factor. It never won't be, but... But not an outsized Not an outsized weight. factor, yes, exactly. So what does that then mean for gas prices? Because we certainly have seen, obviously, as the price of crude has come down, we've also seen some relief at the pump, off just about 30 cents, I believe, in the past month alone. Is that steady decline? Can we expect that to continue, given the movement that we've seen in crude? We think so, yeah. And typically, it takes um, a while for retail gasoline to uh, come down with wholesale prices. Mm -hmm. So there's still that lagging effect that will probably show up at the pump over the next few months. You know, unless oil prices really take, take off again, obviously that is a risk always. But um, if that doesn't happen, and we don't expect that to happen, we think the pump price will keep falling. We, we've seen a fair bit of consolidation over the course of this year in the sector. What does that kind of, and, and how does that play into some of your own projections for the supply side as well going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. As consolidation occurs, uh, we think initially it may uh, slow down supply growth, but, it, but over time it will actually help supply growth because you'll just be uh, in a situation where more acreage and more drilling is in the hands of better capitalized companies mm -hmm. and um, they can grow off of a bigger base effectively. Will we see more consolidation, do you think, within the sector? Yeah, we believe so, yeah. And when we talk about what those deals would potentially look like when some of these oil giants are out there evaluating what the best option is now, how can you give us any insight in terms of, we've obviously seen Exxon doubling down on fossil fuel, just one of the examples, Chevron obviously as well, and then trying to balance that with this transition that we've been talking about to clean energy. How are they thinking about that? Yeah, I, I, it looks to us like they are um, approaching it in a sensible manner. And, and what that means is, you know, you have to stay in your core business and stay good at that because the world still needs tremendous amounts of hydrocarbons while we move to a cleaner energy world. And so you do both. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we think that is what defines transition versus cutting away to something more dramatic and drastic before the technology is ready and before the grids are ready, things like that. So, you know, we think they're uh, balancing uh, both initiatives. Excellent insight and analysis. Yeah. Vika Stuovetti, who is the global energy strategist over at Macquarie Group. Thank you so much for taking yeah. the time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
Our vibe on the street today, bulls versus bears. Wall Street strategist Ed Yardeni is pushing the narrative that the bull market is back, baby, telling investors that Santa Claus rally may proceed through year end. City, however, is telling a different story, saying that U.S. equities are the exception and positioning in other markets such as Australia and Europe are still bearish. So let's break down some of the details on this for you as you're taking a look at the U.S. major averages. This is the year-to-date view here. Let's start with your identity because he sent this in a note to clients at the start of this week and talking about some of the concerns here that might be persisting, particularly around oil prices and higher bond yields. But he says that they've eased. So no moss there. And perhaps that's the reason why he's seeing more of this potential Santa Claus rally ex- extending or spanning into the end of 2023. Yeah, exactly. We were just talking to uh, our guest in the previous block here, yeah. getting his sense of energy prices, where crude is right now, what that looked like here going forward. And he does expect to see some more pressure when it does come to crude pricing. So that obviously then points to uh, what Yardeni is pretty much centering this thesis around at least today when we talk about the fact that we have seen a decline in energy prices. We have seen this pullback here in terms of bond yields. Obviously, that spike, that um, much of that easing here of heading into the end of the year. So he clearly see, sees upside for equities. What that upside looks like for the S&P by the end of the year, 4,600. By the end of 2024, 5,400. In terms of what is going to lead the rally, I think is still the big question out there that's lingering right now. We have been getting some mixed commentary from our recent strategists, from some of the big business leaders that we talked to last week at our Invest Conference. We did hear some bearish tone, especially from Jeffrey Gunlock. He, of course, though, is predicting a recession, and he thinks that we are going to see more pressure on some of these tech high flyers that had been leading the charge so far this year. On the flip side, though, we've been talking to some strategists this week who are a little bit more optimistic about how many of those big tech names are valued right now, and they do see some upside potential within that specific sector. We've also heard some bullish commentary on some of the banks, some of the financials here heading into the final weeks of the year. So Yardeni at least sees some upside, about 4% upside for the S&P between now and year end, and obviously uh, even further upside, 5,400 by the end of 2024. Yeah, and he put the odds of a recession, when you think about what this could look like by the end of 2024, 35% is what he's putting those odds at right now. And honestly, if you were to ask a sample of economists, analysts, and even consumers as well, and perhaps some investors out there, there's still going to be this lingering thought in the back of your head, just as there were among consumer fears that came through between some of the consumer confidence data points that had come out most recently, saying consumer fears of an impending recession remain elevated. That is consistent with the short and shallow economic contraction anticipated, in this case, though, for the first half of 2024. So you think about, on the other side of this, what could lead the rally? What could kind of continue to be one of those catalysts? Well, it's a good news or it's a bad news is good news type of environment that we still find ourselves in, where if we do continue to see a slowdown in consumer spending at certain prices, then that could give the Fed more reason to believe, hey, we can continue to sit on our hands just for a little bit right now. If you continue to see as well a print that comes in below expectation on the jobs front, that could also lead the Fed to say, okay, now we're getting back towards some of the employment rate figures that we had earmarked, even if we were to get to that 2% inflationary target. And so all of those things, the market market will look at and say, well, now we've got a Fed that's going to be sidelined for a little bit and potentially issue some type of cut on the back half of next year is what economists are talking about. And then additionally, at that point, you might have us pass the quiet cutting phase that a lot of companies are looking towards. And then the reinitiation, perhaps, of growth profiles, especially on a margin basis for many of the companies that have been able to benefit on the outset of the AI story and are now looking for another catalyst to point to. Yeah, and it all comes down to the Fed, right? Exactly yeah. what the Fed is going to do. Essentially, when you take a look at the CPI print that we got this morning. It looks like market consensus is at least that a rate hike in the, at the next meeting in December is essentially off the table at this point, going ahead, looking ahead to the next meeting uh, after that in January, taking a look at the Fed fund futures here, 95% still see the Fed holding rates. And then, of course, it gets us to the question about whether or not we're going to see a cut next year and what the timing of that is going to look like. All right, we got to leave it there, but keep right here on Yahoo Finance. The state of housing, a deeper dive into Home Depot's latest earnings and also the latest on shelter inflation. We've got all that for you next. 
Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Happy 10 a.m. to everybody. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith live in New York City. We are 30 minutes into the trading day. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Major averages, they are rising as October's CPI data shows inflation continues to moderate, plus a positive reception for Home Depot's third quarter results. That kicks off retail earnings week here.
Taking a look at some of the individual movers, Snap got the cosign from Amazon today, the e-commerce giant saying that it will allow users in the U.S. to buy some products directly from the app. Now, this comes as Amazon tries to build its relationship with influencers. Amazon's partnership with Snap is going to complement the deals that the retailer already has in place with Meta and Pinterest. And we're watching Tech Resources as it's set to sell its coal business to commodities trader and miner Glencore. Glencore will pay $6.93 billion for a 77% stake in tech's coal business. This wraps up a months long saga that started when tech rejected a $23 billion offer from Glencore, which proposed creating two new metals and coal focused companies. Glencore plans to spin off the combined coal unit in the next two years. And lastly, C Limited under pressure today as the company swung back to a loss in the third quarter. The Singapore-based internet company reported a net loss of $149 million after seeing a profit of $322 million in its previous quarter. Now, analysts are worrying that the competition from TikTok and also from Alibaba may be driving the company to sacrifice on margins. Well, the big story of the day is that CPI print. And while inflation did cool in October more than anticipated, shelter remaining one of the categories that we have seen pricing pressures remain consistent, driving core inflation higher, rising about three-tenths of a percent on a monthly basis, up 6.7 percent from a year ago. It was enough to offset the decline that we did see in gas. Here with some of the key factors driving shelter higher, Yahoo Finance reporter Danny Romero joining us here. Danny, so what's going on? <laughs> well, CPI is for in, for shelter is a lagging indicator. So while we saw the ri another rise in October's results, really it's showing disinflationary momentum. And so if we really compare that to real time data, asking rents has flattened out doing, due to the fact that there is more inventory hitting the market and home prices have been rising. So we really won't see those numbers reflect the CPI data until next year. And also if we go back earlier this year, home prices were softening. Asking rents were also softening too. So we won't, like I said, we won't really see those numbers reflect this time, this data until next year. But I've spoken with economists. They say that the results really show that disinflationary momentum is, is really proving to be true right now, but it could be a bumpy road ahead. And Danny, as the cost of shelter is going up, is that translating to higher equity for homeowners? Brad, people are sitting on high value homes, but there is some real time data from a real estate organization, Adam, that found that homes, people that are sitting with a home that has a mortgage, their equity is slipping and it's been the fastest pace in four years. Well, why is equity slipping? Well, people are not only have their mortgage, but they're taking out a, net, a home line equity a line of credit on top of their mortgage. So they're taking out more debt. And so when that happens, your equity goes down a bit. And I even spoke with a lender from Loan Depot that told me 30 to 40% of their clients that are seeking a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, really are looking for about $75,000 in a loan because they want to consolidate their debt, whether that is they have credit card debt or a uh, auto loan, they really want to find another resource. And for them, the, the home, home line equity line of credit really for them that it rate is about 8% right now. It could go up obviously if rates are fluctuating, but from the last time I checked, it's about 8%. So that's a lot lower uh, than a credit, cry, credit card uh, rate right now. But again, Yes, people are still sitting on a really uh, high valued home. It's just that if you take out more debt, then obviously your equity goes down a bit. Yeah, that's right. Average mortgage rates sitting at about 7.13% in the third quarter. Highest rate that we had seen as long as the NAHB has been tracking that figure. Denny, appreciate you breaking down some more of these details, putting some more color behind the numbers that we're tracking here. Appreciate it.
Yahoo Finance's own Danny Romero. Also, everyone, Home Depot kicked off the retail results bonanza for the third quarter. Not with a bang. The home improvement retailer beat analyst expectations for results, but its revenue was down 3% compared to the prior year as were its comparable sales. Softer big ticket sales, they caused the retailer to signal caution, narrowing its full year outlook. Our next guest anticipated that Home Depot, as well as its competitor Lowe's, may issue lower guidance. Before we got the report this morning, here with the crystal ball, we've got Michael Baker, DA Davidson, Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst. Michael, you called this one correctly here. So does this mean that we're going to see the same for Lowe's? And, and did this even as you were predicting, did it come in line with some of your expectations? Yeah, it, it was largely in line with lower to expectations. I, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the stock up today. Expectations were low. Uh, also, of course, being helped by the CPI in, in the overall <laughs> market. But th this is pretty much as we had expected when we lowered our numbers in front of the quarter. Uh, as it relates to Lowe's reporting next year, we think we'll see something similar. Uh, business is soft out there. I, I would say maybe the best that can be said is it's sort of consistently soft, if you will. It's not falling off the table. But uh, still seeing some weaker trends, particularly, as you said, in bigger ticket discretionary areas. When you talk about some of the average ticket prices here, average ticket is flat for the fiscal year to date. What do you think that's going to look like here? You mentioned some of the challenge, some of the headwinds that are still ahead for this sector, for Home Depot, for Lowe's. So then what does that trend look like looking ahead to 2024? Yeah, the, the ticket is flattened out. That's an interesting question because what we're seeing is that the benefits of inflation, which really drove the average ticket over the last couple of years, has really waned. We've seen a lot of disinflation and, and really it does seem like, and, and again, we see that in the CPI this morning, inflation in this space is is is, is behind us uh, largely. Uh, we don't expect a big improvement in, in that ticket trend in 2024 unless and until that big ticket, uh, the, the big ticket mix starts to come back. And we're just really not seeing that right now. As long as rates are high, uh, consumers are sort of shying away from big projects or, or big durable items. And, and the spending has been much more on smaller type items uh, that, that don't necessarily need to be financed. And that weighs against your ticket trends. Does Home Depot, Lowe's have a lever to pull when it comes to offsetting the declines then that they're seeing in some of those bigger ticket purchases? Well, we think Lowe's uh, has a little bit of a of a bigger lever to pull, if you will, in terms of their uh, operations uh, and, and expenses uh, expenses that fall both in the gross margin line and SGNA, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Lowe's has been able to close the operating margin gap with Home Depot, and in fact, have operating margins that are better this year than last year, despite the lower sales. Uh, now, that being said, Home Depot has identified $500 million in cost savings, which they'll implement next year, and, and that should help their margins. Uh, but right now, we see uh, Lowe's continuing to close that margin gap with Home Depot. Michael, more broadly speaking, I know you had, you had a recent note out on some of the big box retailers and some of the trends that you're expecting here. More broadly speaking, this earnings season, when it comes to the consumer, I guess, how worried should we be about some of the pullback that we are seeing right now uh, at this point in the economic cycle? And who is then positioned best as a result? Yeah, we think what we're looking for for the holiday season, and really we saw it in, in Home Depot's uh, results, is that expectations are properly set, which is to say soft uh, in the third quarter with maybe a little bit of risk in the, in the fourth quarter. We think uh, it will be a modest holiday season. Uh, we're estimating the lowest growth in holiday sales since probably 2016, uh, up low single digits. So not as bad as we were back in 2008 and nine during the Great Recession, but we do think it will be a relatively softer uh, holiday. Uh, who's well positioned there? We think Walmart uh, in, in particular is well positioned. We think they'll put up one of the better comps uh, for the fourth quarter uh, and for the third quarter when they report later this week uh, of all the big box retailers that we cover. Does this signal to you a retail industry more, more largely or sector rather that is due for normalization to start to take place in, in 2024? And, and what would that normalization look like? I think we're starting to see that a little bit. Uh, what we need, uh, I think, to get to normalization, uh, frankly, is for rates to stop going up. And, and it seems like we are getting more towards the end of that. Uh, you know, we, we've had a number of disruptions over the last three or four years, COVID, then supply chain, uh, then massive inventory uh, overruns, uh, then the inflation that we saw. All those are sort of moving behind us now. Who knows what's going to happen in 2024, what unforeseen thing we might see. But at, at this point, uh, you know, with a lot of those disruptions that we've seen over the past three or four years seemingly behind us, it does feel as if 2024 could be a little bit more of a, of a normal year. Yeah. 
Michael, what about shrink? When it got, we, we know that that's been a huge issue here for retailers over the last several quarters. Is the worst of that behind them? Yeah, and another great one that I forgot to mention, shrink. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say out of nowhere, but all of a sudden becomes a major issue towards the end of 2022 and 2023. Uh, for the most part, it, it, it's it, it's one of those cases where it might not necessarily be getting a lot better, but it's not getting worse anymore. Uh, so in that sense, it, it, it really will uh, start to become less of a negative, meaning in some ways a positive. Uh, for instance, Target will report uh, tomorrow. Uh, we think their shrink impact in the third quarter will be similar to the second quarter, which which means it will be a margin impact, but no worse in the second quarter than uh, sorry, no worse in the third quarter than the second quarter. And, and then we do think uh, it starts to get better uh, later in the year. They started to take some to take some actions. They're starting to help a little bit, and you cycle up against where it really started to hurt them a year ago. All right, Michael Baker, always great to get your perspective. Thanks so much for hopping on here with us this morning. DA Davidson, Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst. Thanks. Sure, happy to do it. Thank you. Well, it's that time of year, open enrollment season for health coverage. Aflac's U.S. Chief HR Officer is on with us next to lay out what you need to know. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Stocks are getting a boost from this morning's low inflation print, and it looks like Wall Street is looking to capitalize on the bullish seasonality tendencies into year end. The latest Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey shows funds are withdrawing cash to deploy into stocks and bonds. And now they're at the lowest cash levels in about two years. Here with more, we've got Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to take us into the numbers. Hey, Jared. Hey there. With cash uh, yielding so much, over 5% in a lot of money market accounts, we have seen trillions of dollars on the sidelines to earn that risk-free interest rate. But now, over the last few months, we've seen some signs that fund managers are finally starting to deploy that into cash, excuse me, into stocks and bonds. Here we have the Global Fund Manager Survey showing 4.7%. That is the average amount of cash that this fund manager, that the fund managers who answer the survey, who have about two-thirds of a trillion dollars under management, that is our current level. Now, interestingly, this is now a neutral signal. When fund managers load up on cash, that's a contrary buy signal. So when we have levels above 5%, that is bullish. And when we have them below 4 that is bearish. However, as I said, we have just dropped into neutral territory. Some other indicators, uh, not going to get into, but their bull bear indicator, that remains in bull mode. So it's not as though everything is in neutral here. But all of this is against the backdrop of what these funds have been doing over the last few quarters. And we can see here they are finally getting overweight bonds. And this is the first time that we've seen these levels since the global financial crisis. And only now are we just seeing funds start to be overweight equities. We were talking about this with Josh Schaefer earlier. Now, I want to bring this forward and talk about seasonality because seasonality has worked out for the most part this year. We got a couple of buy signals in October. The last one worked out. The one earlier in the month was a bit early. But stocks tend to end November strong. The S&P 500 uh, going back to, I believe, 1950, that is this purple line here. Uh, and then the pre-election year, that's once every four years of presidential cycle. We're in the third year of that. That tends to end in positive territory, too, although you will note there's a lot of back and forth over the month. And now I want to present seasonality from another point of view. I like to look at the VIX, and we are just coming off a seasonal tendency to spike in September and October. In fact, in fact, we did get these spikes. These line up fairly nicely right here. And now we have dropped. We had those eight days of losses in a row for a VIX. We found a footing down here. We're right around 14. But you'll notice that the trend is to uh, go down into the end of the year. And usually when the VIX go down, goes down, that is when funds are rallying. I uh, do have, a, excuse me, I just wanted to end on another note. This is the S&P 500, which is just breaking to the upside. This is a six-month chart, and uh, this negative trend line here was pretty closely watched. Only within the last couple of days have we managed to break ahead here, uh, but we are clearing some major technical hurdles. People were saying 4,400 is potential resistance. Well, we blew through that. 4,500 is another number, uh, but after this, I think people are going to start setting their sights on the record highs that we had at the very beginning of 2022. So something to look forward to, perhaps, and uh, some caution in the winds as well. All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking down that for us. We've got to talk about more about what's going on with health care because open enrollment is in full swing right now. And it can certainly be a stressful time for both employers and also for employees, whether you're looking to add or update your health coverage benefits. Americans do easily get flustered in meeting one of them over which health care <laughs> options you should choose. So how do you choose the right plan for you? Do you go with the cheapest option? Or how do you evaluate, I guess, what makes most sense for you and your family? Joining us as part of Yahoo Finance's Healthcare Week is Jerry Hawthorne, Aflac U.S. Chief HR Officer. We also have our very own health reporter, Anjali Kemlani, here to help us uh, break down what is a very complex topic, I think, for many, or intimidating topic, I should say, uh, right now. So, Jerry, what is the top thing, or I guess, what do maybe people taking a step back need to take into consideration when they're starting to evaluate which options for health care would make the most sense for them and their families? Yeah, I, I first of all, thank you for the opportunity. And I would tell you that um, I think one of the biggest things is that health insurance and, and planning for health expenses is probably one of the biggest known unknowns, meaning that 
You can save all you can and never need that money, or you can deplete it in a year. And so my advice for families is to actively review, become educated consumers, and think about healthcare planning almost like you're thinking about financial planning. Leverage tax-efficient vehicles like FSAs and HSAs. Go through and review the options that employers are offering. In our AFLAC Workforces report, we found that almost 90% of employees do passive enrollment, which means they just put the same thing that they did the year before. They may not want to do that. They may want to take the opportunity to actually dig in and review and get a deeper understanding of their benefits so that they can maximize the offerings that their companies are providing. Jerry, certainly a, a huge task here at Yahoo. I know there's about 13 links, seven videos, and a really long website that explains yeah. what our benefits are. So it is not easy and very time consuming for the average individual, but the companies do take the time to put these uh, benefits together. And to the point on your surveys, we've seen increasing diversity in benefits and broader yeah. options, things like mental and uh, digital health. I wonder in context of the weight loss uh, frenzy that's happening right now, the drugs key and, and center, do you see a shift in how employers are thinking about coverage for things like that and including those GLP-1s? Yeah, I mean, I think employers are trying to meet employees where they are, right? I, one of the outcomes of the pandemic is that we're we're whole people, I guess is what I would say, instead of just an employee of a company. And so what I've seen employers do is to try to identify offerings that employees are stating that they want. It's interesting, in our report, we found that almost 80% of employers think that employees understand the benefits, while actually fewer than half do. So I I really think the big opportunity is that employers need to not only listen to their employees with what they want, but also to actively communicate what those offerings are on a regular basis. You know, we're in open enrollment right now. This is a great time for employers to kind of put out the glossy brochures and all those fun videos. But the key is really to actively communicating with employees on an ongoing and consistent basis following trends that are out there and making sure that their employees are aware of what's happening. At the same time, all of this costs the company's money. We're looking at, with that broader diversity of offerings, how do you think that companies are thinking about where to make cuts and what to offer? Yeah, that's a hard one because, you know, I've seen expenses going up anywhere. I've seen a few reports between five and 8% for companies um, going into 2024. And I think that, you know, I don't believe that companies will actually start cutting things. What I think is that there will be an increase in cost sharing between employers and employees. And so if that means increasing premiums, if it means increasing co-pays, out-of-pocket deductibles, I think that's what employers will do um, in order to help to offset those expenses. Now, that also reinforces why employees need to become better educated consumers of their benefits. Um, you know, what's the phrase, an ounce of pre prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so what I mean by that is it's really important for employees to maximize the services and the preventative offerings that their employers provide, you know, go get wellness screenings, go get physicals, get mammograms, get colonoscopies, all of those things, it's better to find out things earlier and leverage preventative care than it is to wait and to have higher expenses um, in the longer term. You know, our products at Aflac, from a supplemental perspective, they're intended to help offset those expenses and offering supplemental products is something that some companies have started to do to help em to help employees to, um, to better manage their expenses. In our report, we found that 87% of companies, uh, of employees of companies that offer supplemental health insurance would recommend that to others. So again, preventative, maximizing those preventative services, supplementing those expenses, and helping employees better understand the offerings that companies have. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You got some poetry slam snaps from me <laughs> over here on that That's one, right. Jerry. <laughs> Look, lastly, while we have you, this has been a major year for some labor renegotiations. How has that yeah. changed where a lot of the enrollment process, but as well as the benefits offered, have perhaps shifted at this point in time. 
Yeah, you know, luckily, well, I hate to say luckily because it's not necessarily luckily. It depends on your point of view, but we're not we're not an employer that that has unions. And so it's not something that in my role I have to um, pay a lot of attention to on a day-to-day basis, though I've been following it. And I would just say that, you know, it it is a trend that I think companies are seeing in general, union or non-union. And what I mean by that is employees want employers to think about them as whole people, whether they're part of a union, whether they're not part of a union, companies really need to think about not just Jerry, the employee of Aflac, but Jerry, the mom, Jerry, the, you know, the person who likes to go out to eat on weekends, they need to think about their employees in a more holistic way. And that's really a trend that I think is happening, not only with unions and labor relations, but with, with all employees across the U.S., All right. Excellent insights, analysis. Great to get your perspective on this. Jerry Hawthorne, AFLAC U.S. Chief HR Officer and our very own Anjali Kamlani as part of our own Healthcare Week. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Though it's cooling down, inflation still weighing on consumers and their wallets. What are retailers expecting from holiday shoppers? We've got more on that next. Holiday shopping season is here. With Black Friday just around the corner, a new forecast from the National Retail Federation, known in your hood as the NRF. They predict holiday spending is expected to slow, the most in five years, only growing between 3 to 4% from last year as higher prices squeeze consumers' wallets. For more on the state of retail, we're joined by Stephen Yaloff, who is the Tanger Outlet CEO. Great to have you on with us, as always, and get some of what you're seeing from your outlet centers and and how you're operating, even the real estate presence that Tanger Outlets has. First and foremost, when you think about the shopping experience that consumers have come to expect, what type of outsized volume or or even foot traffic do you typically see holiday seasons and, and how does that compare perhaps year over year? Well, first of all, thanks for having me back on the show. Um, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity 
to give you uh, our perspective on the retail on retail and the, sh the holiday shopping season. So, you know, first of all, I'm speaking to you live today from Nashville, Tennessee, where about two weeks ago we opened up our 37th uh, factory outlet property here, and uh, we, we walked the property all afternoon yesterday. And it's there's tremendous traffic here, and part of it is the newness of the shopping center in the marketplace. But really, what the customers is. Uh, looking for when they shop in one of our shopping centers and i spoke to many of them yesterday is the everyday value pricing and i think that really speaks to where the consumer is currently and heading into a sh uh, holiday shopping season they are looking for the best possible price on the brands they love and they can get them in in our shopping environments so Stephen, are you going to be able to weather any sort of downturn then if we do see further weakness in the economy because of the consumer pulling back some of their spending? We know inflation, yes, while it is improving, still a massive headwind here for so many Americans. Where does that then, though, position you in that scenario? Yeah, well, our retailer partners really have a tremendous amount of leverage in an outlet platform because they can control their pricing almost daily. So if they find that the customer is looking for better value or certain products, you know, it's we've seen it, you know, in the, in the department stores and, and the larger uh, specialty store chains, they flip their store on a regular basis to put the products that sell out front and move uh, the products that might have been on the floor a little bit longer in the back of the store. Similarly, in an outlet format, they do the same with pricing. And if they feel that they need to be a little bit more promotional, they can change that cadence on a daily basis. And in so doing, put a lot of that promotion up front. And that's what the customer sees. That's, that's what they respond to. And that'll get them more uh, circulating throughout their store. And so when you think about the, the retail square footage that you operate as well, what type of inflows into Tenger outlet environments are, are you seeing from some of the largest manufacturers of both high value, high cost goods, and, and even on the other side, some of the kind of lower cost or even medium tier goods. Yeah, I mean, it's mixed. So again, you know, we'll talk about the Nashville Shopping Center that I'm sitting in today. You know, it, it's a mix of brands from, you know, Old Navy to Ralph Lauren. So you can, you can get every single price point in between. Um, the stores are filled with inventory. The inventory is, uh, keeps on coming in. And I think a lot of these retailers are looking for the outlet channel to serve not only as a place to clear that excess inventory, but also as a place to meet the customers where they are. And I think that that's critically important part of the outlet shopping model these days is that the retailers that engage in this part of our business and this part of the you know the retail ecosystem are finding that there's a customer that doesn't shop other channels and this is an opportunity for them to perhaps get a hold of a new customer and then take them up through their their ecosystem and for those retailers those manufacturers that are taking on real estate what how are the terms that are that they're asking for changing right now especially as they're trying to navigate their own cost profile? You know, the outlet uh, real estate, at least in our portfolio, and we talked about it, we, we had our earnings call two weeks ago, and we talked about OCR, which is our occupancy cost ratio. And that basically what that is, that's the amount of rent that a retailer pays as a percentage of their sales. Um, and at 9% or 9.1%, we reported last quarter, it's still the lowest in any of the bricks and mortar channels. Um, meaning that we still have opportunity as a uh, owner of these shopping centers to continue to push our, our rents. In fact, we talked about our rent spreads last quarter uh, being up double digits as far as renewing tenants are concerned, and almost 30% for new tenants coming into our shopping centers. Well, let's talk about the renewal tenants for a second because it's very relevant. We have 95% of our existing tenants across our platform, 12 and a half million square feet, that are renewing every year. 95% of those tenants that are turning that renew are also voting to stay in the same space that they're in, but pay over 10% more in rent to do so. So I believe that speaks to the value of the space, particularly in our portfolio. Stephen, is this something that's across the board, or are you seeing this may play out a bit differently on a region-specific basis? Because, yes, the leasing activity is very high. You have seen improvement, obviously, on a year-over-year -year basis. But are you seeing any pockets of weakness? You know, I, I think, yeah, for sure, it'll happen on a geographic basis. We're primarily a southeast 
um, company. We've got many of our assets reside in that part of the world. We just bought a new shopping center. We closed on it yesterday in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm. We believe in the market. So there was an existing property there, uh, beautiful property, extremely well run, yet we believe based on how we're managing outlet centers right now, our scale, the team that we've built, and the way we see the future of retail, which is not just retail stores, but complimentary food and restaurants and experiences. I think the customer is shopping differently. We uh, and, and we want to meet, like I said earlier, we want to meet that customer where they where they are. When we want to give them far more to do when they come and shop in our shopping centers. As far as areas of weakness, you know, I think that some of the outlet centers that were built 30 or 40 years ago have been perhaps cut off by outlet centers that move in a little bit closer. Those shopping centers need a reinvention as well and perhaps maybe need to be more localized. So I think there's a strategy for all of those properties, whether they're the strongest properties, we're gonna to continue to build them uh, and, and add new uses. The weaker properties, again, we're gonna to respond to the customer that wants to shop in that marketplace and we're gonna bring that customer exactly what they're looking for there as well. All right, Stephen Yellow, always great to get your insight. Tanger Outlets CEO, thanks so much, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me. Well, coming up, strong demand for international travel, boosting airlines this year. But how big of a headwind is the growing conflict overseas? We'll discuss next. Robust international travel demand boosted revenue for airlines like Delta in recent earnings reports. But will the upward momentum last? It's a big question. I asked Delta CEO Ed Bastian about his outlook for overseas travel and whether he anticipated any drop heading into the new year. I think it's going to continue to stay strong. Yeah. Obviously, watching what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Ukraine, and some of the, the risks around European travel into the next year, I'd say is something that we're, we're, we're guarded around. But you know, we're not seeing any, any, any reductions sure. in, uh, in anticipated travel. But I think that's the air of caution. But Asia, uh, China's still not really open yet. And so we've got the second largest economy is still not traveling. So I do think internationally we're going to continue to see strong trends there as well. And you, you talked about that on the earnings call too with, with the conflict in the Middle East. Um, inbound and outbound flights to Tel Aviv had been suspended through October 31st. Have you needed to extend that? Yeah, well, it's on a rolling suspension and I don't anticipate we'll be flying, unfortunately, into Tel Aviv 
for quite quite a number of uh, weeks, if not months. Uh, you know, it's, it's really going to be dictated by the by the conflict and when it's safe to return. We're ready whenever you know we feel comfortable. Then our crews are comfortable going back in. And uh, boy, it's been a, it's been tough to watch. And so that rolling suspension, something that we've begun to hear from additional airlines who have routes that go through Tel Aviv or to Tel Aviv as the destination. United Airlines, one of the other major U.S. airline operators that does have routes both from the East Coast and uh, some other ports that and airports that go directly into Tel Aviv as well. And so that also they announced yesterday would be on a kind of rolling consideration at this point in time and the extension of that suspension of service right now. Yeah, and it's interesting here when you take into account the impact that this could have, and it goes beyond, obviously, the domestic airlines. And there was a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, research that was put together here from Forward Keys, looking at specifically some of the booking trends that we have seen. And they took into account what the trends were three weeks prior to October 7th, when we did see the attack by Hamas on Israel, and what we saw in the three weeks after that attack. And to no surprise, I don't think, tickets to the Middle East, that dropped about 26 percentage points in comparison to the activity that we were seeing three weeks prior, comparing that to the drop that we saw in the three weeks after the attack. We also, though, saw declines in Europe, Americas, and Asia Pacific, although to a much a smaller degree. Uh, flights booked here to Europe falling three percentage points. That was the difference there. Americas off a six percentage point. So, I think this points to, yes, there is some hesitation among travelers to where they are traveling to, and maybe they're thinking twice in terms of specific regions when they are booking those trips or are, are, are booking the leisure uh, travel right now. But overall, it seems, at least for the domestic airlines, yes, it is a headwind, obviously a challenge and personal challenge for some, but in terms of the company impact, the business impact, not too significant yet. It continues to showcase how many consumers were resolving to see the yeah. world after COVID era lockdowns and international travelers and some extent remaining undeterred and it should not come as any surprise as you do have some of the extended waivers the refunds to passengers during the scheduled cancellations and suspensions impacting the the region in the middle east specifically but how that overflows into some other areas of international travel especially when we just got from the conference board some of the consumer data in their surveys that showed that among u.s consumers foreign country travel plans are at some of the high shares that we have ever seen. And so that is going to be kind of the juxtaposition that we continue to juggle at this point in time, especially with the international travel picture right now. All right, we'll stick with our international base stories here in the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, APEC Summit, kicking off this past weekend in San Francisco. Now, President Joe Biden and China President Xi Jinping are set to meet this week to strengthen, hopefully, communication between the two countries and also manage some of the rising tension that we have seen play out. Now, the summit will run through the end of this week. For more on what we can expect, Yahoo Finance reporter Ines Frey joining us now. And Ines, lots of focus on what exactly this meeting will cover, what it's going to entail. What do we know? Yeah, that's right. And the big uh, meeting that is, of course, that face-to-face -face meeting that will happen between President Joe, uh, Joe Biden and also President Xi Jinping of China. And it's significant because this will be the first face-to-face -face meeting between the, between the two leaders in one year, the last time it was in Bali in November of last year. And it's also the first visit of, visit of the Chinese president here to the U.S. since 2017. Now, this conference is a large conference. There are 21 members uh, member countries that are part of it, including the U.S., Canada, China. But of course, that China-U.S., to those topics that will be discussed between President Biden and Xi Jinping, those will be of much importance. As you mentioned, strengthening communication, managing competition. Look, there's a lot going on right now between the two countries. You've got the CHIPS Act that was passed last year. You also have tariffs that have been put in place during the Trump administration that are still in place. You've got the Middle East tension the ongoing war in Ukraine. And from an economic point of view, most experts would say that it's not in either, si either of the side's best interest for the deterioration of relations, the escalation of tensions between the two countries, as we've been seeing. And you have seen that the Biden administration already this year sent to Beijing uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Uh, also, she himself uh, has also met with 
with uh, Bill Gates. Mm. He's met with Governor uh, Gavin Newsom of California. So certainly both sides. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a trepid uh, meeting because you, you, we have had escalating tensions between the two countries. So what is the most important issue to each side here? So for the U.S., one of the big issues will be uh, to reestablish military communication with China because China suspended military communication last year in protest to then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And this includes ship and aircraft operations communications. For China, it will be everything surrounding technology. Remember the CHIPS Act and restrictions that are against uh, advanced semiconductors uh, to China. And then you've got the regional conflict and both sides are really at different ends of the spectrum here with those regional conflicts. The Eurasia Group put it pretty put it in a bottom line, basically saying expect modest outcomes and quick test of a relationship in secular decline. So. Wow. <laughs> All right, we're going to be watching this very closely. Thanks for teeing this up for us. Yahoo Finance reporter Inez Ferre. Also, United Auto Workers President Sean Fain set to appear in front of a Senate committee today. And much more on that conversation going to be coming forward later on after securing deals with the Detroit three automakers. Fain now has his sights set on non-union plants in the U.S. He's expected to outline his plan to organize those sites. Joining us now, we've got Pross Supermanian. Pross, what do we know about what's expected here? Well, he's talking right now, and you know, did anyone know who he was six months ago? Sean Fain, he was relatively You probably nobody. did. I, yeah, he wasn't a household name. He was, he came out of nowhere, won a slim election, and now he's the biggest rock star in the labor movement. I mean, <laughs> bottom line, he's there right now talking from Bernie Select Committee in the Senate, talking about how it's now labor's moment, and then you also teased up, you mentioned the fact that he's talking about how we can, or how they can unionize some of these non-union plants. You know, look, labor's having his moment right now, right? Um, Sarah Nelson from the, uh, the flight attendance unions is there with him as well, talking about that sort of thing. And uh, I think the big push right now for Fain is that he wants the federal government to help more uh, with their uh, push to get even more gains across not just autos, but across the, the labor landscape. Um, he's talking about how, uh, quote, we need the muscle of the federal government, not just as allies cheering from the sidelines, but elected leaders that understand that economic justice is a national security risk for all of us. Um, this is a fight worth fighting for. We need to bring that fight into the workplace and into the streets, but also into the halls of power and the chambers of the U.S. Senate. So, um, look, the effects of this, of the uh, UAW's record-breaking historic contract are that now Toyota, Honda, uh, and as well as Hyundai yesterday announced that they're going to raise pay for all their U.S. workers who are not union. So we're seeing that knock-on effect here, and he's saying we need more help, too. Press, how, is that enough, though? Because I think that's the big question here, just in terms of when we talk about the fact that this is a movement, Sean Fain has pretty much become, for better or worse, a household name at this point, given how he was successful and was able to negotiate which many of these, what many of these union workers view as favorable contracts. So, yes, we have seen some of the automakers outside the U.S., foreign automakers, raise prices, uh, raise wages here for their workers in the U.S., but what then comes next, do you think? I think, you know, we saw a couple of the plants vote down the the, yeah. lab, the, the, the tentative agreement. And, they, and there was supposedly complaints about lack of defined pension plan. They, they wanted that and they wanted to shorten work week. These are the things that maybe are sticking points that that might be what's next is, mm -hmm. you know, it's not that they want four days. It's the fact that sometimes they have to work six days a week and they say, we just want five days a week. So I think that might be the next phase as to what they might go for uh, when their next negotiation is, is that. And defined pension plan, that, that, that's, a, that's a hard sell these days. That's a very hard sell. They want the post-GFC or great financial crisis workers to get that because the ones prior to it have it now. And of course, how much pressure that's going to put on these automakers, too. Yeah. Yeah. They're shelling out even more cash for this. Yeah. yeah, We're going to be continuing to track this throughout the day here. That taking place live right now in front of a Senate committee. Thanks so much, Pros, for bringing this to our attention, breaking this down for us. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Few words are as emotive in American discourse today as healthcare. It's an industry and a system that both insiders and patients agree is broken. From affordability and access to the government's drug pricing negotiations, the challenges are endless. Meanwhile, big box and digital health are pressuring traditional systems. Companies like Amazon and Walmart are thinking about how to get you to think about healthcare while you're shopping. Then there's the excitement and apprehension around AI and what its role is in healthcare. And of course, the buzz surrounding the newest weight loss and diabetes drugs and what it means for other industries. We'll tackle all this and more in a special series starting November 13th, only on Yahoo Finance. Well, this is Healthcare Week at Yahoo Finance, and it certainly has been a week of one where we are unpacking a number of issues. Certainly, this industry was disrupted during, well, before, but also uh, really picked up during the COVID-19 pandemic, and then also has changed the way so many millions of Americans access their care. And we talk about what the healthcare landscape is going forward right now. We are in the middle of open enrollment. Many Americans are considering what benefits work best for them personally, also for their family. And when we talk about the fact that you need to pick what option is best for you, it can be very overwhelming. When you take a look at some of the trends that we are seeing heading into the new year, we have seen the rising cost of healthcare. Obviously, Americans are feeling pressured in almost every aspect of their life right now when it comes to higher costs. So they are facing yet another year of prices rising once again. So making some of those elections even more critical. We talk about the fact that you're trying to get the best care possible, but you also have your budget in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And this came up and there's some new methodology as to how even the Bureau of Labor Statistics in CPI and the core or the consumer price index is going to be tracking healthcare going forward. I won't go into the nitty gritty of that at the rate of potentially having our viewers eyes gloss over. But one important uh, relative importance here that we had seen over the course of kind of that year over year move is that the health care insurance, health insurance, did move lower year over year by about 34 percent. So that's interesting to track, at least within the data that we had come through this morning. Also, everyone, big box retailers have made a lot of moves in the last year. But a decade ago, there were some major players that vanished. Circuit City was one of them. It was a big name in the mass marketing of televisions, refrigerators, and this thing called a boom box that you may remember, plus some CD players. It had over 1,500 stores with over 40,000 workers and then it went bankrupt. Now it's looking for a comeback, initiating a Series A funding round and a strategy no longer focused on brick and mortar here. There is so much to really unpack, but the strategy that's really been laid out as of this morning, because I think a lot of people had a dose of nostalgia when they saw this news come across, it's Powered by Circuit City Partnerships is the way that this is going to move forward here. And they're initiating and announcing the launch of a Series A funding round with these plans for strategic alliances with some national companies here. So really what that Powered by Circuit City Partnership could look like I think is going to be interesting. Is it a store within a store? Is it a store within even a website as well where you've already got traffic that flows into one larger retail entity, but now you've got this outpost that Circuit City is also able to make sure that they're maintaining Maintaining and at an interesting time, because as we've been talking about throughout the morning, appliances, electronics, not doing the best in some of the CPI print that we Yeah, seen. I think the big question that we uh, are asking here when we read this headline was just why now? Why does it make sense for Circuit City to try and reinvent themselves and relaunch at a time that it is so tough here amongst the given landscape for consumers right now? But this is at least they're pioneering a store-in-store -store concept. They're saying that is going to be the centerpiece of these collaborations right now. In terms of demand for this, why it makes sense, maybe, they're saying that it addresses the gap here in terms of various industries often recognize the potential for this lucrative space, but they lack the necessary expertise and the infrastructure. So Circuit City hope, hoping that they could partner with many of those nationally recognized brands and reinvent their business for the future. We'll see. All right, let's do a quick check of the markets here. Just about 90 minutes into the trading day. You're still looking at broad gains across the board on the back of that better than expected inflation print, cooling prices here helping the market of the Nasdaq up just over 2%, the S&P up just about 2% as well, the Dow up just over 500 points. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Rochelle Akufo and Akiko Fujita have you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's what we're watching this morning. Inflation cools in October. Falling gas prices help the number, but rent is still a big problem. What this signals for the state of the U.S. economy. And striking up a hefty cost. A new report from Moody's is estimating studios could take a $600 million annual hit from new union contracts. But what does this mean for the industry? We're going to be discussing. Plus, our healthcare week continues today with a deeper dive into how weight loss drugs are impacting the sector. Our Anjali Kemlani will speak with the Obesity Medicine Association president. You won't want to miss that. First, though, let's take a look at the market action right now, 90 minutes into the trading day. And yes, we've got a rally on our hands here with the Dow up more than 500 points, the S&P 500 up 87. And take a look at the Nasdaq, the biggest gainer on the day so far, up more than 2%. This coming on the back of what we just mentioned, that weaker than expected inflation print, giving investors some relief that the Fed may be done finally raising rates. Uh, we've been watching those Treasury yields very closely. Some big swings in that space across the board on the shorter end as well as the longer end. Taking a look at the five-year yield right now, uh, down about 20 basis points here. The 10-year yield down 17 and the 30-year yield at 4.6%. In terms of sectors we're watching today, real estate and utilities seeing the biggest gains, but pretty much across the board, seeing a rally here. Well, as we said, prices are falling once again. Uh, after rising for the last two months, the consumer price index cooled in October, rising 3.2% on a yearly basis, remained unchanged month over month. Looking at core inflation, which includes the volatile food and energy sectors, inflation remained hot, driven by rises in shelter costs. One sector where we saw major relief was energy, down 2.5% on a monthly basis and 4.5% year on year. Here to break down the number for us, we've got Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre. Inez, we were expecting some relief, at least with gas prices, given where oil has trended. But certainly, the market really liking that print that we got this morning. 100% Akiko and gasoline prices you hit it on the head the nail on the head there because we have seen a downtrend when it comes to gasoline prices and that is reflected in this inflation print you mentioned energy prices the energy index down 2.5% month over month well gasoline was down 5% month over month on your screen there you are seeing the national average for gasoline at $3.35 per gallon and that's according to AAA. That fall in gasoline prices in October, that helped to offset those shelter costs that you mentioned at the top there. Now, other components of the energy index, fuel oil, that was down 0.8% year over year. It was down 21.4%. Electricity costs, those were up month over month. And natural gas, those were up month over month. But natural gas is down year over year, 15.8%. And gas Gasoline compared to last year also down. We want to put back up those gasoline prices so you can see where they're at right now. Even in pricey California, you are noticing a downtrend with gasoline prices, with California's state average at $5.06, down almost 60 cents over the last month. 11 states now have gasoline that is under $3.00 per gallon. And those 11 states are all in the Gulf area, as you can see, Texas, Alabama, Louisiana. Those also are states where there's big refineries as well. So you would expect those gasoline prices to be lower in that area of the country. But the fact that you've got now gasoline at below $3, below $3.50 on the national average, even California is seeing declines, although California's prices are still the priciest in the nation. So this certainly bodes well for inflation. Indeed, and certainly welcome news ahead of the, the Thanksgiving travel season as well. Thank you for breaking that down for us, our very own Inez Ferre. Well, the major indices are rising as October's cool inflation print marks an important milestone for the Fed in its fight against inflation. Investors are now betting on a 100% chance that the Fed will hold rates steady in December. So how can we expect this report and other upcoming data to impact markets? Well, joining us now is Dan Griffith, Huntington Private Bank Director of Wealth Strategy. Good to see you here. So... I mean, you have this bumper day here. I know that in your notes you talked about, you know, a catalyst for the markets outside of earnings. Does this do it? 
I think it's definitely one of the things we've been looking for, which is that signal from the Fed that they were probably going to be in a good position. And we've been holding our breath to see when the market was going to take off. When the Fed was ready to give us that signal, the market was ready to go. And there's a lot of good fundamentals out there to suggest that there's a lot of support for the market growing a little bit, uh, not just kind of the Fed's action, but a lot of good fundamentals as well. Uh, Dan, we have seen inflation coming down, though, for several months now. I mean, what is it about this print specifically? What is it that you're seeing there that gives you confidence the Fed will, in fact, pause at least through year end? Well, I think a lot of the fundamentals we mentioned before go back to the conversations we're having with a lot of our clients specifically. You know, Huntington is a, a company based in the Midwest. And as a result, we get to talk to a lot of business owners who are based in the heart of the country. We recently con uh, finished a study with them where we asked them how they were feeling and what they were concerned about. More than 57 percent of them said that they were very optimistic uh, more than 60% of them said that they've had a, a better year this year than before, and only about 8% of them put themselves in a really negative position. I think that ha that conversation informs a lot of what we're looking at because it is a good way to look at how supply chains and inflation and all of the other factors we just were mentioning before are affecting real business owners and the real consumer as well. And Dan, of course, we're getting a fire hose of data, not just from, from Fed speak. We're going to be getting a lot more inflation data, jobs, payrolls as well. But I noticed there are five numbers that you said that you're watching for when it comes to looking at recession expectations versus a soft landing versus inflation into 2024. I know that year over year CPI at 4% was one of them. Break down some of the other ones that you're looking at here. Yeah, that's right. Obviously, uh, we're looking at some of the other core numbers that are important, making sure that the jobless numbers stay below $300,000 as a key number. And we are starting to see that number tick up a little bit uh, as far as continuing jobless claims. So we are watching that as something to be at least a little cautionary and careful about. We're also looking for a 4% year over year CPI, 5% uh, Fed funds rate, which we think again, as we mentioned before, we think the Fed will probably continue to pause here and not go up a little bit. Um, and we also think making sure that the S&P stays above 4,000. And today is definitely a demonstration of the fact that uh, it's got 4,000 well in the rearview mirror, it seems like. Uh, Dan, I want to get back to those comments you mentioned about uh, business owners that you've been speaking to, because that really is kind of the, the pulse, right? Where, where the consumer sentiment is, the business sentiment is. Um, what are you hearing about the biggest concern right now with where things are? I mean, we keep talking about this disconnect between where consumers are spending, what they say or how they say they feel versus what they're actually doing in action. What are you hearing from business owners? I think a lot of business owners are concerned about, you know, the, the, the consequences of the credit market. If you think about the work that the Fed has done over the last two years uh, in raising rates and all the other work that, that obviously they've accomplished, even though all that's happened, many people still haven't really felt the consequences of higher interest rates. If you haven't bought a new car in the last two years, if you haven't bought a new house in the last two years, if you haven't had credit card debt that you've needed to finance in the last two years, then those higher interest rates really are just something you read about uh, or listen to uh, in places like Yahoo Finance. So as a result, it's not something that you feel in real time. I think a lot of our business owners now are starting to see consumers who are beginning to pay those bills uh, and business owners themselves, uh, financing expansion are starting to do that. Many of our business owners, well over half, also said that they have plans for expansion for their business. Much of that expansion also involves the use of credit. And so it's one of those things that, uh, that, uh, that business owners are concerned about as well. So then going into 2024, if you're mentioning that some of these effects still haven't still haven't hit as a lot of people, you know, staying in their homes, not taking on a, a bigger mortgage, then at what point do you think reality is, is going to set in, especially for some of these small businesses? Well, it's going to be a tough one. I think, you know, we, we've been very optimistic as to the, the potential for a soft landing. We put the risk of recession all last year at about 55 percent. I think a lot of the other prognosticators out there were a little more pessimistic than we were. And it's interesting, we're still at 55% as far as a risk for a slowdown next year. And a lot of people have kind of come back to the position that we've been in. Uh, again, I think that position is informed by the business owners in our part of the world that we talk to every day. But I think we will start to see that slowdown, you know, mid-year, if anything. We also don't think it'll be a very deep slowdown. Uh, and we think that the, the opportunity for a soft landing is still, is still very solid. So, Dan, you're expecting a soft landing. You're expecting the Fed to pause. With those conditions in hand, how do you advise your clients? What do they do with their money? 
A lot of them right now are asking about fixed income. And of course, today we saw the 10-year yield, you know, dip well below four and a half, which I think is you know, something that hasn't happened very often. Um, you know, we're, we see clients who are thinking about locking in higher yields longer term, uh, which depending on circumstances, we're obviously always talking about the tax consequences of doing that. You got to make sure that it works for your strategy. Um, but the other interesting phenomenon that we experience is when you talk to clients about higher yields, and then you go back and say, hey, but you're giving up the opportunity uh, with inflation and really good days like the market is experiencing today to really see some appreciation and growth, a lot of them are still interested in being exposed to the market. So we've obviously pulled back. We haven't changed asset allocations dramatically, but a lot of our clients are still interested in being engaged in the market, particularly with the kind of earnings uh, strength that a lot of the, of the market is beginning to show as we come out of an earnings recession. They still want to be involved in the market, and so we're happy to help, uh, accommodate them. Okay, certainly some good takeaways there. Some new optimism coming through. Dan Griffith, Huntington Private Bank Director of Wealth Strategy. Good to talk to you today. Thank you. Time now for our trending ticker. We are watching shares of Take Two pop this morning after getting a boost to getting boosted to a buy rating by Deutsche Bank. The firm also raised its price target to $175 a share. The analysts are bullish on upcoming product announcements from the gaming company, including the highly anticipated trailer for GTA 6. They also say they expect the company to continue to deliver high quality content into 2024 and 2025. Take-Two has popped year to date amid consistent gaming demand throughout 2023. That stock up more than three and a half percent today, Rochelle. Um, this continues to sort of go with a broader trend we've seen in the gaming space, which is this optimism um, around sort of increased usage. Remember, when you think about where things were after the pandemic, there's concern about demand pulling back. People were outside of their homes. They weren't on their couch just playing. We've seen a lot of positive, positive commentary coming through in this earnings season around gaming. It's true. But I will say, when it comes to Grand Theft Auto, that is just one of those titles that just really knocks the socks off of everybody. I mean, uh, there were some tech experts at Secure Cheats. They analyzed Google search data after the announcement of that trailer for GTA 6. The searches went up by 705%. That is how much interest a title like this generates. And we did wonder what the sort of the next evolution was going to be for gaming. We've seen more pushes into cloud gaming, mobile gaming, and then we also saw, of course, PlayStation come out with their, their own portable new device as well. So it really does show the evolution of this, but also the power of some of these very big titles that some of these companies still hold as well. Yeah, I mean, Rochelle, the fact that I know Grand Theft Auto is probably an indication of how big <laughs> this name is, because I am not a gamer personally. I don't know if you play. The thing is, I, I play a little. I dabble, but I'm I'm not a, like I've never played Grand Theft Auto. But you you can't help you can't help but hear about it, and, you know, especially the way people drive in DC and Maryland. Grand Theft Auto is a, <laughs> as a theme for how we drive around here. That does tend to come up quite a bit. <laughs> That's an interesting use case. Maybe a primer. LA drivers too, I will say, <laughs> a little go. crazy, but uh, for a whole nother conversation there. All right, shoppers shying away from bigger ticket purchases. Wait on Home Depot's latest earnings report. How much longer will folks put off upgrading appliances before the trend breaks? Much more on that on the other side.
Shoppers downsizing to smaller projects have chipped away at Home Depot earnings. CEO Ted Deck is saying the home improvement company experienced pressure among certain big ticket discretionary categories. So what are those items that consumers are spending less on? Home Finance's Brooke De Palma has that answer for us. Hey, Brooke. Good morning, Rochelle. Well, more than two years ago, customers were splurging on, it seems like, just about everything. And now we've seen that come back a bit, two years post-pandemic. CEO Ted Decker is calling 2023 a period of moderation. Now, the company did beat expectations. Sales were down, though, three-tenths of a percent compared to last year. But that wasn't as low as Wall Street expected, which was down 3.31 percent year over year. Revenue also came in a bit higher than anticipated at $37.71 billion compared to estimates of $37.7 billion. And adjusted earnings per share came in a tick higher as well at $3.81, which was higher than analyst expectations. But while Home Depot is seeing what they say is the narrowest performance gap in some, ty um, some time between its two consumers, those DIY everyday customers, and what they call pros, there's still a stark difference between just how much people are spending compared to last year, especially on those big ticket items. On the call, Home Depot's Executive Vice President of Merchandising weighed in. Take a listen. The comp transactions for those over $1,000 were down 5.2% compared to the third quarter of last year. We continue to see softer engagement in big ticket discretionary categories like flooring, countertops, and cabinets. However, we saw big ticket strength in pro-heavy categories like roofing, insulation, and portable power. But Halloween items did have a record year in sales for Home Depot, both in-store and online. And the company also said its performance in the first two weeks of Q4 are on track to achieve its full year 2023 guidance. Now, Home Depot did narrow that prior guidance range. The company now expects sales to drop between 3 to 4 percent compared to last year. Adjusted earnings per share also expected to decrease 9 to 11 percent year over year. As Home Depot really looks to find its footing here. CEO Ted Decker did say on the call that it's looking to build a balance between growth in transaction volume and in ticket sizes. And this also comes at a time where there are higher interest rates weighing on consumers' abilities to finance their purchases, as well as lower commodity prices like in copper and lumber that ultimately did drive lower ticket sizes. But Home Depot seems to be winning over Wall Street today. It is one of the top trading tickers on Yahoo Finance's website. And it's on track to see the biggest injury gain in 11 months and on pace to, for its largest percent increase since November of 2022. So certainly lots of excitement for Wall Street, but Home Depot has a long way ahead if we ever will see it get that uptick in those big ticket items once again, like we saw a few years ago. Yeah, those interest rates always sort of creeping into the conversation, particularly around a home renovation. Uh, Brooke DePalmo with a breakdown of Home Depot results. Thanks so much for that. Well, inflation is moderating, but consumers are still feeling the pinch of high food prices. The consumer price index show that food sales rose 3.3 percent on an annual basis in October. For more on the latest CPI data, let's bring in Sucharita Kodali, a Forrester Research Retail Analyst. Uh, Sucharita, good to talk to you today. You know, we have heard from retailers that, yes, consumers are still willing to spend on groceries, even if they're pinching on discretionary items. And yet here we are still talking about an increase of more than 3 percent in prices year on year. How do you think that set things up for retailers going into year end? So I think that the grocery numbers are really part of the explanation for why the consumer is still a little bearish on the economy, even though overall consumers are still spending, um, they're not happy to spend. And even though gas prices, energy prices are down, um, the food number is the most visible. That's what you see when you go to the grocery store. People are often shopping in these categories and subcategories within the grocery sector multiple times a week. And when you're seeing the numbers go up, that is something that um, you're not feeling good about. And it's outpacing um, by a smidge the overall inflation number. So the consumer is absolutely feeling it. And um, that is also reflected in some of their attitudes, which are not all that positive, unfortunately. And so, Chirita, when we look at food price inflation, particularly food at home, compare, especially compared to where it was last year, have we reached a new normal at this point or, or is there still more to go? 
I think that that is absolutely right, that the numbers have not come down. So what you are seeing is just overall higher numbers on everything from um, produce to poultry to the dry goods that are in the middle of the store. Um, and there's also a lot of the consumables that are not necessarily food, but there are those grocery items, the toilet paper, the paper towels, um, the, uh, the, the, the pet food that um, very much uh, pinches the pockets of consumers. And when you are not seeing these prices come down, that's absolutely problematic and it is going to weigh on consumer confidence and ultimately how well a consumer feels about the economy. The previous speaker said that um, you know, most people aren't going to be taking the loans on a daily basis where they're going to feel um, the impact of inflation, but where they feel it is when they go to the grocery store, the club store, um, or you to Walmart or Target every week. Why have these prices been so sticky, you think? Is this about retailers feeling that they still have leverage when it comes to pricing power? Is it other factors? I mean, how, how do you sort of break down where inflation is still? There's a lot of finger pointing um, all the way around. Um, when you listen to earnings calls, you have the CEOs of major retailers pointing the finger at CPG brands. You have CPGs pointing um, the finger back at retailers or saying that consumers are willing to bear the cost. Um, ultimately, the shopper is going to be driving what they are capable of spending or, or not. And the consumer in especially a market like the United States, has ample choice. And while people complain because they're unhappy with the prices, um, that doesn't mean that they are not purchasing or they're they're not choosing um, to, uh, to substitute away. We see this also in food away from home. The restaurant sector um, is, is equally problematic for inflation. It is at this point nearly as large as the grocery sector and um, inflation there has been has been pretty strong as well. Yet um, the consumer is covering the cost of the food away from home, and is the increase in the cost of food away from home. Um, and that very much suggests to me that there's a disconnect between how people are feeling and what they're they're actually doing. And to that point, I mean, we did see a lot of higher earners turning to Walmart as, you know, trying to pinch pennies like, like everybody else when it comes to groceries. But I want to ask you about Amazon's grocery reboot and their expansion into this space. How competitive can they be, especially as they try and balance customer growth with profitability? So Amazon is the largest player in the grocery space online. Um, the grocery space is the smallest of all of the e-commerce categories um, because it's still largely an offline category. It's very difficult to fulfill grocery goods. Um, and what we break grocery out into is essentially um, food versus non-food, and even within food, you have perishable and non-perishable. Um, everything that is non-perishable and non-food tends to do much better on Amazon. Um, but the place where Amazon often tends to struggle, and you see this in um, some of the changing um places where the Amazon Fresh business has sat within the organization and some of the shifts that they've made to the apps. Um, really, the, 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 the perishable part of the business, which is food, um, the frozen section, the produce section, poultry, um, that's really where offline stores and companies like Walmart tend to thrive. So some of these changes that Amazon is making is often, um, I see it as a reflection of just them continuing to try to figure out how they can win in the fresh market and how they can continue um, to gain share, um, candidly, in, in grocery, which is still an underpenetrated category online. Where can they get, gain share? I mean, when, when you look at the overall market, how that pie breaks down, who does Amazon chip so away at? So Amazon can chip away at all of the various parts. So you have um, on, on the non-perishable, non-food side, um, they can continue to grow the share that they, they have. Um, this is an opportunity for them to grab share from players like Instacart or, or even from, from Walmart or players like Chewy, which also play in the space. 
Um, on the other extreme, when you're looking at the perishable section, it is a an enormous pie where um, most of the online grocers don't have um, a significant play altogether because it is such a difficult category. Um, but at the same time, they do have the Whole Foods business to help um, support some type of a buy online pickup in store option. They are building out a very extensive localized fulfillment network, which um, may be able to even accommodate, um, you know, different temperatures and different different types of uh, grocery products within the full assortment. Um, so they are trying a multi pronged strategy. They're trying a multi pronged approach. It appears. Um, and they're experimenting with different ways to fulfill these items because ultimately um, the fulfillment is really where the grocery industry online has struggled and will continue to struggle until we can, you know, teleport goods, which is probably not going to happen in our lifetimes. I guess stranger things have happened. I guess we, I guess we'll see. But appreciate you joining us, Sucharita Kadali, Forrester Research Retail Analyst. Thank you so much. Let's get you a quick check of the markets right now. Still seeing a rally across the board here, although pulling back a little bit for the S&P and the NASDAQ. But solid gains, you can see the Dow here currently up more than 560 points on the day. You see the S&P creeping back up about above that 4,500 mark, currently up 2% on the day. Tech heavy NASDAQ, they're also up two and a quarter percent or 309 points. Sector wise, real estate though leading the charge, energy the laggard, but all S&P sectors in the green. All right, coming up, Hollywood strikes are done. Actors are back on set, writers are back in the room, but studios will have to pay the price for breaking down the costs behind those hard-won contracts next. Plus, what Autodesk's big AI announcement means for the tech company's future, we have that after the break. Well, Hollywood's double strikes may be over, but new contracts are expected to result in hefty price tags for major studios. A new Moody's report pointing to a payout in the amount of hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's bring in our very own Ali Canal to break this down for us. A payout expected, Ali, but what kind of money are we talking about? 
Yeah, so Moody's saying that those contracts with the writers, actors, and directors, it's going to cost studios an estimated $450 to $600 million per year. And while, yes, that is a lot of money, Moody said spread out over a large number of projects will not pose a credit risk for the studios in isolation, especially if you think about how much these types of companies spend on content, around $100 billion globally if you add that all up. But Moody's did say these studios will look to uh, cut costs in other areas, and that could include enlisting fewer A-list talent actors, approving less on-location filming, and trimming post-production and special effects spending. Studios may also more aggressively pursue production incentives like tax increases and financing sub subsidies, in addition to leaning on more imported content. So at least on the content side, on the production side, we likely won't see any impact there, because at the end of the day, content is king and these businesses don't want to make any moves that are going to hurt their storytelling capabilities. That being said, though, you are already seeing these types of companies really focus on what they want to produce. Disney, for example, they've really stressed quality over quantity. They lowered their 2024 content spend to $25 billion versus the $27 billion it spent this year. So uh, studios are still being a, a very cost conscious at the end of the day, especially as they continue to work to reach profitability within those very tricky streaming businesses. And Ali, it's worth noting that Moody's called out certain companies that will feel the pain of higher costs more so than others. So who's most at risk? Again, it's really those companies that have exposure to the streaming side. Moody's did list specific companies, Disney being one of them, along with Warner Brothers Discovery, Comcast, Paramount Global, and AMC Networks. Those will be the companies that will most likely feel the impact of higher costs, coupled with escalating streaming losses, which Moody says it expects will continue in 2024, and for some of these companies, even 2025. That being said, though, we did see a boom uh, in free cash flow virtually for all of these companies during the strike. So that should help offset some of these higher costs. So if you look ahead into 2024, we'll probably have some tough year-over-year -year comps when it comes to free cash flow. But again, that's going to greatly help these companies as they work to pare down some of those losses on the streaming side. Ali Canal, staying on top of this story for us. Thanks so much. Well, Autodesk making a splash this week, launching products integrating artificial intelligence. Autodesk's AI has generative capabilities and provides intelligent assistance for those in building, product design, even media. The announcement is debuting at the tech company's Design and Make, Make Conference in Las Vegas, where over 10,000 designers, engineers, builders, and creators are gathering this week for Autodesk University. So what's next for the tech company. To tell us more, let's bring in Andrew Anagnost, Autodesk CEO and president. Um, Andrew, always good to have you on the show. Uh, walk me through what this means for Autodesk clients. We've heard so much about generative AI. How does this all work? Yeah, so, so first let me tell you, I'm here in Las Vegas at Autodesk University, and obviously I'm spending time with all the talented design and make professionals that build everything around us. And yes, we announced Autodesk AI this week. And one of the things that's really important to talk about here is these industries, they have massive capacity problems. So they really need to be able to build more with less. There's not enough money, there's not enough labor, there's not enough material to build everything that needs to be built and rebuilt. So what we're doing is we're focusing on helping them wrangle data with AI, helping them automate some of the processes that create very sophisticated high fidelity 3D models. And we're helping them smooth some of the connections between various teams within the ecosystems they work so that they can actually get some of this work done faster, more, uh, more cost efficiently, and using less materials. And so do we have an idea yet, Andrew, of what sort of cost cutting this sort of productivity brings to the table? Yeah, we do. So let's, let's look at example, let's talk about the scale of the problem first off, all right? Uh, a lot of our customers in AEC, for example, are experiencing a lot of pressure around sustainability and new regulations and new requirements from both owners and governments. By one estimate, we have to build the equivalent of 2.6 trillion square feet of new real estate over the next 40 years. That's like adding a New York City to the world every month. 
That is a massive capacity problem. So what we're trying to do is help them make better decisions earlier in the design process and move processes that probably took months down to weeks. And that's really the goal that we're trying to do here is help them get from complexity that took them months to wrangle down to weeks while also making sure they make better choices about how they're building and what materials they're building with. Andrew, I've been looking at a breakdown of what this means for individual sectors that Autodesk serves. Interesting to me to look at the particular impact on media. Autodesk Flow, as the company describes it, automates scheduling for media and entertainment production, sort of managing all the changes that come with that. What does that mean for existing jobs? Yeah, so th first off, you, you highlighted just before we, I came on the whole issue with streaming services. People are trying to build good, high quality content rapidly for streaming services. Their costs are going up. So obviously, they're going to need to reduce their costs, but they're not going to reduce the number of artists that are working on some of these projects. What they need to do is make these artists more efficient. So some of the things you were talking about, especially connected to Autodesk Flow, we're allowing pro uh, producers to automatically generate schedules that may have taken them weeks to months to produce, but let AI build out the schedule and then re redesign the schedule as new shots come in or other shots fall out or as an artist swaps out into different things. We don't see this replacing jobs because the studios have a pretty serious capacity problem. What we need to do is help them get more throughput from the resources we, they have. And that's what we're focused on. And so, Andrew, when you look at some of the sectors that have the biggest room for upside, obviously some, some uh, of these sectors, for instance, manufacturing already had some of these elements in it. But in terms of the ones that are perhaps best primed for disruption in this space, which are the standouts for you? Yeah, it's, it's architecture, engineering and construction by far. And, and the reason for that is that that is the industry that is significantly less digitized relative to other industries. You know, IT spend in manufacturing is, is in clearly in the double digits for almost every manufacturing enterprise out there. It's in the single digits in most of architecture, engineering, construction. They have not yet integrated their processes in such a way that they're getting the productivity lifts of digitization. So this is going to have a big impact on the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Connecting those things together is an imperative, and they're going to be spending more money on technology in the future so that they can kind of address these capacity challenges. But that's the industry that's going to see the most change. Andrew, you've always got a pretty good pulse on uh, what CapEx spending looks like for some of the industries you serve. We've heard over and over that higher rates are sort of crimping the budgets of so many of these companies. What are you seeing and how is this pushing further efficiency in the industries that yeah. Autodesk so, works with? So obviously consumer inflation's down, it's declining, but you know things are still a lot more expensive than they were a year ago. And people are making really deliberate choices about what kind of things they're reaching into the supply chain to use for specific projects. They're looking at optimizing how they can get to certain types of materials and use certain types of materials that might be in stock or maybe overstocked so that they can make some of these more intelligent choices. So we see our customers spending a lot more time making really sophisticated and careful procurement choices as they navigate this higher cost environment. Andrew Anagnost, uh, interesting to see just how quickly things are shifting on that front. Autodesk CEO and President joining us from Las Vegas today. Thank you. Let's do a quick check of the markets right now as we continue to track this rally that we've seen on Wall Street coming through from that weaker than expected CPI print. The Dow now up 1.6 percent. The Nasdaq seeing the biggest gains up more than 2 percent. The Russell 2000, by the way, having its best day since November of last year. And Treasury yields, when we're watching the 10-year tracking, the biggest jump since March of this year. Well, coming up, a new wave of weight loss drugs are spurring the biggest business battle in years. What do these new medications mean for the patients using them? Anjali Kamlani talks with the president of the Obesity Medicine Association on the other side of the break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm senior healthcare reporter Anjali Kimwani. As part of Healthcare Week here at Yahoo Finance, we're taking a closer look at the latest blockbuster trend to rock the medical world anti-obesity drugs. Names like Wagovi and ZepBound have gripped headlines and fueled massive profits for drug makers. And the drugs may do more than just help patients lose weight. A recent stu study from the New England Journal of Medicine found Wagovi cut the risk of serious heart problems for patients without diabetes. But what do these drugs mean for patients and the future of weight management? Joining me is Dr. Angela Fitch, president of the Obesity Medicine Association. Dr. Fitch, pleasure to have you on. Obviously, some exciting news in this space. For years and years, I know you, have, you and I have talked before about how finally the stigma of obesity is lifting. But how does this, this news of Wagovi's impacts sort of help the industry with broader than just anti-obesity implications? Time where we finally have been able to show what we've known all along, which is that uh, treating obesity is not about weight loss, it's about gaining health, right? It's about gaining health, not losing weight. And again, we finally have been able to show that. We've known that for quite some time, but insurance companies, one of the big issues we have in our country is that obesity treatment as a disease is not a standard benefit on health plans. So hopefully this will change that and make obesity a standard benefit on all health plans for all Americans. Yeah, definitely that's part of the implications looking at broader coverage. But I know there's other studies happening right now with Wigovi, in fact. Um, and then obviously the implications for ZepBound sort of filter through this. There's other diseases that are being looked at. For years we've known Hi. that GLP-1s do have some implications for other diseases. Are we starting to see maybe more studies coming in that help support that? Yes, we have this study that was just published recently um, on uh, cardiovascular disease as far as um, heart failure, uh, which looked at uh, Wegovi in patients with heart failure, which showed a significant benefit in that category. We know the kidney study uh, was just stopped early because of so many good benefits. They couldn't ethically continue the study because they couldn't continue to give patients placebo, knowing that there were such profound benefits uh, in kidney function and prevention of worsening of kidney function and kidney failure and dialysis. So we're going to see all of these you know, great benefits from the treatment of obesity, and we hope that that will you know, also be part of what uh, is seen with our new medications as well coming forward. Yeah, these new medications really interesting for multiple reasons. Obviously, a new trend and better weight loss uh, uh, results. I wonder about how this plays out, though, when it comes to you know to your point initially for coverage, but also for patients in the long term. There's there's definitely been debate about how long patients are willing to stay on some of these drugs, knowing the side effects. As of right now, what do you think will be sort of this, you know, long-term impact if there are people maybe dropping off the drugs after a year? Yeah, well, I think, you know, some of the data we have right now showing that patients do drop off medication is, is not necessarily related to them not not tolerating the drug, it's because we have a huge access and a supply issue. And so again, you know, the recent data is a little bit um, misleading because we haven't been able to keep patients on medication. We've had a lot of, of um, telemedicine companies and other companies that have come forward uh, taking advantage in this space of getting patients access to medication. But it's more than getting a patient an access to a drug, it's about getting a patient to a doctor who can take care of them. And that's a different story than just someone, you know, texting and getting a drug, you know, um, by, a, by a text. So again, I think, you know, the more we treat obesity as a chronic disease, we're going to see more and more patients being able to tolerate these medications and stay on treatment, just like in the clinical trials where less than 15% of people, you know, or 16% of people stop treatment because they couldn't tolerate it. And we know, of course, the pills are on the horizon in that pipeline. What about uh, the, you know, the improvements to things like diet and that whole care solution that I know you've talked about before? We seem to not have as much on hand, uh, at least in the in the headlines, if you will. Uh, but definitely something that needs to be paid attention to, especially in light of the fact that there is a shortage of these drugs right now. So there seems to be both demand for the drugs, uh, at least just to try them out, not enough supply, and then simultaneously not enough attention on other areas where healthcare can help with weight loss. 
Yeah, obesity is a chronic disease and we need to treat it that way. You know, we at the Obesity Medicine Association have our pillars of obesity treatment, which includes focusing on nutrition therapy, uh, physical activity, behavior change, things like stress management and sleep are very important to overall health and weight management. And then also our medications and surgeries. So again, it's important to deliver the whole comprehensive spectrum of care over the course of a patient's lifetime. This is a lifetime disease. Uh, at my new clinic uh, called Knownwell, we treat patients from uh, teenage years all the way to um, adulthood and into their late adulthood. Um, and so again, treating this as a chronic disease is what's gonna be so important moving forward uh, because it is something that patients are gonna struggle with. It's not a quick fix. There's no nothing to, to be a quick fix about it. And really quickly before I let you go, how would you differentiate, you know, what's different this time around with this conversation and these drugs? Well, I think what's really different is, again, that we finally, as you mentioned when you first came on, that we finally have uh, started to decrease the stigma of the disease of obesity. You know, the disease of obesity has very much been felt by patients and by society that it's just their fault, that if they could just somehow live differently within the society that's been put before them, if they could somehow manage that, they would not have this disease. And we know that that's not true. And I think now more and more we're seeing the benefits of these medications the SELECT trial, there was a benefit even before weight loss happened. Mm -hmm. So that shows that there's a benefit of the medication by itself, not just um, you know the weight loss. Absolutely. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Dr. Angela Fitch, president of the Obesity Me Medicine Association. Thank you for having me. Stay tuned. All your markets action ahead on Yahoo Finance.
From hair care to homemade ice cream, products from Shark Ninja are taking TikTok by storm. Its viral hair tool, which rivals the Dyson Airwrap, has been a particular standout with users making reviews and how-to videos to entice viewers. But with sticky inflation squeezing consumers' wallets, will higher price point items still be on your holiday shopping list this year? Mark Barocas, Shark Ninja CEO, joins us now. I'm sure you hope so. I know I got roped into buying the, the Ninja Creamy. My daughter absolutely loves it. But what are you seeing in terms of demand for some of your higher priced items and any promotions that you think have really been successful? Well, look, you're right. I mean, the consumer has faced, you know, inflationary challenges now for the better part of the last two years. And, you know, we've always been focused on making sure that we're delivering to the consumer extraordinary value. We think that Shark Ninja, you know, is well positioned, you know, based on the performance and the multifunctionality and the quality and reliability of our products um, and the value that we bring to the consumer. And, you know, as you said, I mean, th there are challenges that the consumer has, but I think the innovation and the marketing that Shark Ninja brings um, has brought a lot of excitement to the category. Uh, Mark, we're going into a season where typically you see, you know, the heaviest shopping um, being done around the holidays, but we're also hearing about consumers who are slowly turning a little more cautious. How much pricing power do you think you have? Well, look, you know, we came out of the third quarter very strong. I mean, we grew our top line revenue about 15 percent in the third quarter. You know, our international business, you know, is growing significantly. I mean, we generated 80 percent growth in the second quarter. Uh, we had strong growth in our North America business. So, you know, I, I would say that, you know, Shark Ninja brings products across a lot of different price points. We're not the highest priced products in the market. We're not the lowest price. But you mentioned earlier on the Shark Flex style, you know, which is a great selling product for us at $299. But we also recently just launched the Shark Smooth style, which is a $99 product. And it gives the consumer a way to get into the Shark Beauty brands, you know, at a really reasonable price point. So we, we think we have a lot of different price points covered depending upon, you know, the, the, the consumer's desire. Uh, but Mark, as you think about consumers shopping a little earlier this year with uh, wallets a little tighter, I mean, are, are you thinking about uh, offering more aggressive discounts? What's, what's the thought process going into the holiday season? Yeah, I, I don't think we're, we're expecting, you know, uh, increased discounts. In fact, in the third quarter, we actually saw discounting down a little bit um, versus uh, prior year. So, you know, as a business, you know, we spend about 6% of sales on R&D. We spend over 8% of sales on sales and marketing. And, you know, we feel like this holiday season will you know, be in line, you know, to last year, you know, from a promotional or, or pricing standpoint. I mean, and, and we are continuing to see our average sell prices increase. Well, I'm sure if I see that catalog come through the door from Target or Amazon, I'll have to hide it from my kid. I know she'll probably try and grab whatever the newest gadget is. I appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Mark Barocas, Shark Ninja CEO. Thank you so much. But, thank you. Well, let's get your final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still solidly seeing green across the board, coming a little bit off the session highs, but the Dow still solidly up above 500 points or at 522, up 1.5%. Also looking at the S&P 500 there, up about 82 points at that, almost at that 4.5 mark there. As you can see, up 1.87% on the day. Tech heavy Nasdaq, though, the big winner so far, up over 2% on the day at two, up 289 points. Also taking a look at what we're seeing with the Russell as well. Breaking some records here today as we're looking at having the best day in a year. These small caps currently up almost 5% on the day. So certainly something to watch here as we continue to see this rally today. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufa alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.